Hey guys, happy Saturday. Good thank good to see you all. Thanks for being here. Um, I will occasionally have to stop and pop a cough drop because I do have a cold. So hopefully it's not too annoying to you guys and you can't hear it through the mic. Uh, just want to say hi to people. Tom, good to see you. I didn't talk to you today, so I'm, I'm seeing I didn't know if you knew we'd be on, but thank you for being here. And I agree with you that Marvin Harrison, I'd be very happy if they take him, if they do, if the Patriots, if the Patriots have identified a quarterback that they think will be their potential star for the next 10 years, then that's the way to go. But if they're not confident in that, go with the sure thing and Marvin Harrison, because they have too many other things that they need to pick up. So I agree. Uh, ha happy to see everybody, all the regulars here. We have our nice little core group. And I'm always happy to see people that even have different, that are respectful, but have different ways of viewing this case, like Jeff Williams. Um, and um, other people will be popping in too. So thank you guys. I appreciate it. Uh, let's just see who else here we want to say hi to. Lee Zaka is going to talk. Uh, she's asked a question about covering fallacies in logic. Uh, the fact is, I haven't. I took a logic in college, but that was a long time ago. I, it was one of those things that I was very good at and actually used to tutor other people in. But um, the actual specific form, you know, the rules of logic that you would take study in a textbook are not something that I promise you I will go into. 
or could go into at this point, unless I did a refresher course. Uh, but good to see everybody. Uh, let's we're going to try to keep this as fun and respectful and two sided as we can, while still sticking to evidence and trusting in logic, which I do. So tonight's episode is a difficult one, as it may come at a personal cost. I'm going to touch on a subject I'd really rather not, Sean's interview of Joan. It's risky for me to discuss it. Well, it's risky for me to even say why it's risky. This is one of those situations where either you know what you're looking at or you don't. And if you don't mind saying anything, it might come in a class. So I'm going to try to just be fair to Joan, who was articulate and likable. So I'll be open to various interpretations of her words. I'll fill in some details about things I do know that you may not with confidence. But unless things are presented to me in a way that I'm confident in or I'm sure about, I don't tend to present them. And this is also one of those cases where it's best to maybe let the families voice things in their own ways on their own time. And I know that can be hard. But I so I'll I'll I'll, I'll get into this a little bit, but I don't want to really prejudice anybody too much. Uh, my preference, as you guys know, has always been to focus on the evidence. And but there is a legitimate phenomena here in that interview yesterday. That's something that's gonna that is a very human phenomena that will come into cases like this, and so we have to be aware of it. Uh, we all have different skill sets. These are things. These things are a combination of talents we're born with and experiences that we've had. Now, I have a very good sense of what I am and am not good at. Most things I'm not good at. I can't fix a car or build a shed. Because of my line of work for 20 years in the bar industry, I was in the middle of a thousand fights, many more, and I'm pretty good at breaking them up, but I'm not a good fighter myself. I'm a shitty dancer. I never tried acting, but God, that would be a disaster. In Turtle Boy's interview with The Globe this week, he said he's a journalist and an entertainer. And those two things are in ways in conflict with each other, but in other ways, especially for a podcast journalist, they're linked together in a vital way because journalism is based on tips coming in. Don't let anyone fool you. That's 98% of it. And that's true with Turtle, true. Too. That's true with Turtle, too. It's all about the tips that come in, and you have to decide, you have to weigh those tips. And, and make your best decisions on them. And that's where the journalism comes in, is deciding what's a real tip and what isn't. But it's not like he's out there or I'm out there or most people are out there digging this stuff up themselves. There are some people that did. Kate would not call herself a journalist, but that's what she did in this case, is go out there and dig into this for her own reasons. But she did probably the closest thing to that kind of journalism that anybody has seen here. Well, Gretchen Voss, too, she did that. And she has the backing of a... She's, she's a standard journalist because she has the backing of the Globe and Boston Magazine. So, But the tips don't come in on these cases unless your audience is big enough. So that's where being an entertainer, an entertainer is so useful. Now, Aiden is entertaining to a lot of people. As I said, I know my strengths and weaknesses, and I'm no entertainer. But what I am good at is analysis, weighing of evidence, thinking things through in an objective way. And this case has taught me that, as it turns out, a lot of people aren't so good at that. Even people who are otherwise very intelligent. It's, I know it's going to rub a lot of people the wrong way, even supporters when I say something like that. But I, I, I just, I'm too old to not be honest about things. And I'm just being honest. And what I really want is to encourage people to get better at weighing evidence a little more logically. That's all. That's a big goal for me here. In this case and in anything. That's been the theme of my show really all along. Now, I'm perfectly well aware, like I said, that what I just said is a turnoff to a lot of people, but I can't, it can't be avoided anymore because we're seeing too much poor weighing of evidence by good people in this case. Now, I am very happy that over the last several months, the core group here in chat that's developed are also people that are very good at weighing things logically. So we support each other, and I'm incredibly grateful. And not only that, but relieved because it's encouraging to see that that's out there. So it's been a really good experience. Now, one of the things I've tried to get people to focus on is foundational evidence and essential logic. In the Delphi murders of Abby and Libby, sorry, I was just getting a message. In the Delphi murders of Abby and Libby, the defendant's own words 
put him at the scene at exactly the time of the murders. He described several witnesses, and those witnesses described him there. The trail ends at the 700-foot Monon High Bridge, and at the other end is private property, so it's a dead end. Richard Allen was last seen by a witness, a young adult, on the bridge minutes before Abby and Libby arrived. Now, Richard Allen said he was on the trail from 1.30 to 3.30, but no one saw him after 1.50. And that's when the young woman saw him on the bridge moments right before Abby and Livy arrived. And no one saw him walking back towards the entrance. It's a, the trail is a one-way thing. No one saw it. There were many other people on the trail. Many people were talked to, the other witnesses, and no one ever saw anybody looking like Rich and Allen walking back. And we know it's because he never actually did. He led the girls down the hill at the end of the bridge, across private property, and forced them across the creek, and then killed them on the bank. Then he cut through the cemetery to get back to the road to go back to his car. Now, there's more evidence, and he confessed over the prison phone to his wife. Yet there are still legions out there who think he's innocent. What do they point to? Odd things, because there are always odd things in any investigation. The search for Abby and Libby's killer went on for six years and went down all kinds of avenues, all kinds of dead ends. And each one of those avenues is potentially littered with things the defense can turn into odd things that they can point at, odd things that create doubt because people are not good at weighing evidence logically. They zoom in on one odd thing or another and just lose focus on the foundational evidence. Excuse me a moment. Now, in some cases, the foundational evidence is not clear. It, in the Lizzie Borden case, for example, and oh, by the way, we're going to the Lizzie Borden house on April 20th, a Saturday at 1130, if you guys would like to join us. And then we're going to have lunch and drinks at Scotty's Pub nearby. Now, this is not a free Karen Reed event. This is not a Karen Reed event, so we don't care if you're free Karen Reed or whatever side you, you are. I mean, let's, we'll keep that chatter out of it. So uh, Dave McGrath will be going too, and we're going to have a good time. And so we'll talk about Lizzie Borden. Maybe we'll talk about the Patriots or other cases. Let's keep it a friendly event and avoid anything that divides us now. Uh, so more on that later. But if, if you want to join us, reach out. So anyways, in the Borden case, Abby was killed around 9.30 a.m. Only Lizzie and Bridget were in the house at that time. Andrew was killed an hour and a half later. And again, only Lizzie and Bridget were in the house. Neither of them heard the attacks. During Abby's murder, Bridget, the maid, was outside washing windows. Lizzie was in the house. Abby was killed on the second floor, but Lizzie didn't hear anything. After 10.30, Mr. Borden got home. He had been downtown doing his rounds, and he was killed at 11. Bridget had gone up to the third floor to her room to take a nap. Lizzie said she went out to the barn. Both Lizzie and Bridget testified that Bridget went up for the nap, so they're in agreement on that. Bridget didn't know that Lizzie went out to the barn. If she did, only Lizzie is there to say that she went out to the barn, and that's her explanation why she wasn't in the house when Andrew was killed, her father. The house is small, smaller than your standard three-decker. That's a Massachusetts term for anybody outside of Mass. It's hard to imagine anyone other than Lizzie having the opportunity to kill Abby and Andrew because of those things. It's hard to imagine a killer coming in and killing Abby at 9.30 and then hiding it, staying hidden in the house. Again, it's, it's a pretty small house. If you go on the tour with us, you'll see it. Um, so Lizzie seems to have been the only one with the means and she did have motive. She inherited great wealth, but there's a big problem. The murder weapon was never found and they looked multiple times over days. The police had decided Lizzie was the killer within hours. So they were determined to find that weapon. So they lined up the four axes and hatchets in the cellar, but they didn't match. So they kept them on the table down there for days as this searching went on. They brought in masons to take apart the chimneys. They emptied the septic pit. They dragged a small pond nearby. They brought in carpenters and left no stone unturned inside the house. To believe Lizzie did the crime, you have to believe either she somehow hid the hatchet so that it was never found, even in th throughout the next year before the trial, or someone helped her remove it. Now, these things are not at all impossible but they do seem quite unlikely, right? So just looking at the core evidence of that case, looking at it logically, there's a legitimate mystery. So, so there are cases like this. 
Now, Sherlock Holmes said, when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. So there's our logic thing, right? Um, there's a fallacy in that. And there's actually, let's just, let's just talk about it this way. This should be some, some caution attached to that. This method is really only a very good starting point, and it should be the starting point for most cases, right? Because sometimes it's not easy to eliminate every alternative. And sometimes you can't quite conclude something is impossible. You can only say it's extremely unlikely. Now, is it possible that Richard Allen in the Delphi murders was on the bridge at two minutes before the girls arrived, yet never saw them, and he stayed on the trail till 3.30, but no one else somehow saw him? Yeah, it's possible, but it's highly unlikely. You can't say that it's impossible. Is it possible he would falsely confess to his wife over the prison phone as he did? Yeah, possible, but it's unlikely. How unlikely? Well, we can look at things like mental breakdown or intimidation. The defense is going with a claim that two guards working at the prison and working with the real killers forced him to make this false confession to his wife. Because these, this, the confession is admissible, and, and all those all calls in prison are recorded. So that seems very unlikely to me. But as I've said many times in this channel, probabilities multiply. So that's something I want people to be aware of. If there's a one in ten chance of the Red Sox winning the World Series, and a one in ten chance of the Bruins winning the Stanley Cup, there's only a one in one hundred chance of them both winning this year. Now you can apply this to cases. If there's a say a one in 10 chance of Richard Allen being there on the trail at up till three 30 and no one sees him after two. And he doesn't see Abby and Libby who are minutes away from the bridge. Then there's a one in 10 chance that's being generous that Richard's confession to his wife is false. So if you have a one in 10 chance of Richard Allen being on the trail after two and nobody's seeing him or him not seeing the girls, let's call that a one in 10 chance of him being there being an innocent explanation for that. And also a one in 10 chance for there being an innocent explanation for his false confession in prison. So that you multiply them together. So for both of those things to happen and create innocence, that's a one in a hundred chance just by the multiplying together. So, and that's before we get to the other evidence in the case, such as the unspent shell that's found with the girls that matches to his gun, you know, and whatever other evidence will come out in trial. So you, these things, if something is, if you can, just the idea is if something is very improbable, but not super improbable, if you have a, several of these things, you, you multiply them together, and then the thing becomes super improbable. So in the Karen Reed case, there are a lot of these kind of things. Odds are very much against evidence being planted because there was really no opportunity to tamper with the taillight or to bury it in the snow without being seen. Again, people always get confused and think that I'm on the side of the cops um, or I just trust in cops. This is a big part of this case here. And we'll see this in the interview with Joan is that a lot of it is just based on people have a, a, a very profound mistrust of authority or of the police. Now, a lot of times I'm with them, right? Cause it's nothing like anti-police. It's more just, I believe that, there's a lot of corruption in the world and human beings are capable of a lot of corruption. And I've seen a lot of corruption in my life when I own the bar. And I've also seen, uh, read, you know, I've, I'm, I'm a news hound. So I followed a lot of corruption that have gone on with the FBI, the state police, local police. It's just part of life. It doesn't mean that every case involves corruption though. And I can also say that in my time as a bar owner, as a bartender, uh, I, worked with and dealt personally with a lot of cops and the overwhelming majority of them were the kind of people you want to live next to the kind of people you want to babysit your kids uh coach your kids little team little league team i mean most of these guys were just you know they're not they're, they're flawed people like all human beings but were generally a, a little bit of a cut above your regular person i mean they, they were good people so that was my experience now that, that, but it's a it's a when the one time you experience corruption with an officer or a or an officer that that bullies you or something like that and I've witnessed it and I've experienced it it really sticks it really sticks you you never forget it it's a really difficult thing to go through because you feel exposed you're you're powerless against something like that
So it's a very difficult thing to get out of your system. Uh, but that's why in a case, though, you want to focus on evidence. And so for me, looking at the taillight, it's not that I say a trooper couldn't ever plant evidence. Of course they do, and they have. It's I look at, in this specific case, whether there was an opportunity to tamper with the taillight and whether there was an opportunity to plant the evidence. And once by the end of the summer, I had pieced together that there was almost no opportunity or very, very limited opportunity to do that here. It, it became something that was very, very unlikely. It had nothing to do. I don't know the police involved. I don't, you know, I don't know the investigators. Uh, I'm not defending them. I'm just applying the logic of it. And there was no access to Karen's SUV until after it was towed. And that was 16 hours after the crime. That's a long time, especially in this day and age in a world with everybody's got cameras on their phone and there's video cameras everywhere. So, and then it, to get it to the scene in front of all those other troopers and the news crews and bury it, very difficult to do. Impossible? No. I mean, but it, very, very difficult to do. And then, but then you look at other elements and these become things that are also very improbable and you can multiply them together. So in addition to the difficulty in planting evidence, microscopic taillight pieces were plant, were found on John's clothing. Were those planted too? That's very difficult to do. And would, would a trooper even think of that? Who would think of that, right? That, that would have been something they would have had to think of much later. And so now you're talking about, again, access to that evidence that's sealed up, right? Now, again, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's probably unlikely, right? There's a reason that these systems are in place um, to even know how to plant microscopic evidence. What, is someone going around with test tubes of or vials of microscopic taillight pieces? I mean, again, not impossible, but unlikely. So if you think that the opportunity for planting taillight evidence if you if you think of the opportunity of tampering and planting taillight evidence is let's be generous to the conspiracy theory and say it's one in ten i mean that's about as generous as, as i think you can be but then if it's also again let's be generous that there's only a one in five chance that microscopic taillight pieces were planted on john's clothing so now you're talking the one in ten times the one in five means a one in fifty chance of there being a, being a conspiracy. And each one of these things that you look at that are improbable, they multiply. So, I mean, and, there's a, and a lot of these things really start to add up in here. And it's the same thing when you look at the idea of John going inside the house. You know, to conclude that John could have gone inside the house, you have to believe that the GPS is somehow wrong, the most... Uh, the most accurate location data in existence or you have to maybe believe that john dropped his phone and went inside the house without it then was attacked and then was deposited on the lawn on top of his phone now it's not impossible right but it's a little bit absurd right so it's going to be certainly very unlikely then you get to the fact that 11 people inside testified they never saw john come into the house in the truck outside ryan nagel never saw him walking up the driveway now, after learning all that, it kind of takes an act of will, maybe even I would say faith, to believe John went inside the house. You have to be unbothered by the absurdity of a plot that has the killers depositing John on their own lawn, not near the street, but 12 feet onto the lawn, close to the neighbors, close enough where they could have just a few feet over put him on the neighbor's lawn, but nope, on their own lawn, and he's alive where he might have been saved. And been able to tell the police what happened. So now, and what is to me an ironic twist, despite their best efforts, and I think improper efforts to help the defense, the feds have now strengthened the already airtight case against Karen because they left no stone unturned. They looked at all the relevant messages. They have the kind of intrusive power that the state and the defense can only dream of. They no doubt looked at plenty of data themselves, such as geofence and the GPS. They interrogated witnesses, interrogated them before a federal grand jury, and they found no cover-up. And it's not reasonable at this point to conclude anything else. Not only did the prosecution and the defense, but the judge has now read 
the report from the feds, looked at all the evidence they submitted. And all we hear about are butt dials and non-butt dials. Yeah, we do hear a claim maybe about 227, but we haven't seen the report. And Jackson is known for distorting these kind of things. Like, you know, remember his non-human hairs, which was no which, which was a ruse, and the non-existent library gap. So we don't really know what's in that report that the feds have. We do know that the guy who wrote the software for Celebrate, a European company, is is going to testify testify for the prosecution and he's made clear that timestamp is not accurate now do we know for sure the feds found no cover-up well they've told the attorneys of brian albert kevin albert brian higgins and chief berkowitz that their clients are not targets the u.s attorney could have said no comment we're doing and we're just no comment during this because we're in the middle of an investigation they didn't instead they actually gave the lawyers permission to tell the court that they were not a target, that those people were not targets. That's incredibly indecisively powerful. To cling to the idea that the feds are going to come to the rescue here is now kind of like hoping the 2023 Patriots might still make the playoffs. It's time to give that dream up. It's not rational. It speaks more of a need to believe in something or in some cases to keep the grift going. Now, are there odd things about butt dials and hugs and gifts? Yeah, but there are always odd things in every case. If you have the power to look deep enough, you'll find them. Richard Allen's defense in Delphi has identified quite a few in that one, but it doesn't change the core evidence. Same with the 2023 Patriots. The record is now what it is and it can't be changed. Now, I want to get to a delicate subject, Sean's interview with Joan. Um, I'm going to play it, but not all of it. I, and I will have to play some of it at high speed. I've jumped around. I've marked some points. This is on Sean McDonald's channel through the motions. If you want to see the entire interview, it was recorded, filmed live a couple of days ago. All right. So just to be sure, I'm not. I'm only going to give an incomplete understanding of it so if you really want to get a better understanding you'll have to watch the whole thing now i didn't know anything about joan before this other than it i did hear somewhere along the way that she was someone that had been working with sean on his team maybe this summer or maybe this fall taking pictures i'm not really sure about that so i really didn't hear much about joan so i didn't go into this with much of an understanding or any kind of a predisposition. Um, I don't know. I know Sean's been doing some things, sending people around Canton to take pictures and watch witnesses and surveil witnesses and you know, stuff that's a little bit suspect, right? But I I don't know if Joan was doing the end of that. You know, let's let's say she wasn't, you know. Um, so when I watched it, and again, I didn't know her, she came across as sincere articulate and motherly but i have an old bartender's eye and i look for little signs i spent years in the bar where we had regulars and group dynamics all the archetypes you might see in humans alpha males and betas and femme fatales and nesters uh, newcomers would come into that world and try to win acceptance to the group there was a lot of caring and camaraderie definitely a lot of humor but also jealousy and territorial behavior. Uh, and so from behind the bar, you have you have a front row seat on all of that. And you have to watch it all because the best way to stop any friction or trouble is to catch it at the earliest stage. So a bartender looks to pick up clues that many regular people might not. I'm sure it's very similar with teachers in school, with their classes. You know, there's they become used to studying signs in their kids and so they pick up that there's going to be trouble long before it actually happens and also i think probably um correction officers with prisoners probably the same thing they learn to spot these subtle things and that could save somebody's life if they're spotting them ahead of time so i spotted some here in this interview I, i'm not going to comment too deeply on them just kind of show them to you and I, I, I maybe make a correction here if i could or point something out but i i don't i want to walk delicately here you know, um, cause I don't know Joan and I have any, no reason to think that she's doesn't believe things. Um, 
you'll see she's not someone that really focuses on evidence. She's someone that focuses on her feelings. And that doesn't make her a bad person. It doesn't make her an unintelligent person. She's an educated person. I think she said she went to Boston College. She works, I think, in health healthcare, maybe. So those are all positions that require intelligence, and you'll see she's very articulate. But there are also things that, well, I'm not, I, no, nothing, nothing to do with those prof professions. But you'll see that she is like one of those. There are people out there that trust their so much in their gut feelings that they maybe aren't looking close enough at their own motives too. Is there some? Some people not some people are very intelligent, but they're not very inward looking, and they don't try to dissect why they do what they do, why they believe what they believe. Doesn't make them bad people, but it's just they're not very inward looking. So they don't they're not very good at rooting out their own biases. And I think that's something that we all need to become better at. Something I've just by nature have done all my life, and I was taught to do it in college and freshman year and Philosophy 101, that was the, uh, God, I can't remember the professor's name, but that was one of the big things was to focus on was was presuppositions. He'd have that on the board all the time and you had to, you'd highlight them in your papers and stuff like that. It was a big focus. And I think it's important, you know, but that's Socratic too, right? Know thyself. So I don't know. So again, I want to be fair about it. I don't want to offer too much commentary on this. We'll jump into it. It's you know, we'll highlight some clips and just keep in mind. And that's why I put this on my title here today. The essential evidence has not changed. The essential logic of what I've pointed above has not changed at all. So I don't know. That's what made I was. I don't know. When I watched this the other night, it, it, it actually put me in a very down mood, to be honest. Um because Joan seems nice and likable and so does Sean. And you, there are times you're tempted to say, you know, Sean could, is really good at this. You know, I'm talking, not, I'm not talking about investigations. I'm talking about interviewing people. And he comes across as someone that is connecting with that person. Now we also should keep in mind, Sean has been in close contact with this person since at least late summer. So they're not strangers to each other. And they're completely on the same side on trying to promote a certain side of this case. All right. Now, again, I want to bring on a screen. This is something that could. Don't overreact to this. Let's just have a little fun with it if we can. Um, this is just one way of looking at the phenomena that we're going with here one way. All right. So let's not take it too seriously, but let's maybe just keep it in mind. Oh, hello, dear. I'm Agnes, your neighbor to the right, my right, not yours. Forgive me for not stopping by sooner to welcome you to the block. My mother-in-law was in town, so I wasn't. <laughs> so what's your name? Where are you from? And most importantly, how's your bridge game, hon? <laughs> Wanda, charmed. <laughs> As a matter of fact, where's Sir Liz? How many years? Lucky gal. The only way Ralph would remember our anniversary is if there was a beer named June 2nd. <laughs> and let me tell you, what Ralph could really use is how to goose your wife so you don't lose your wife. This is gonna be a gas. <laughs> what about seduction techniques? <laughs> that you should stumble when you walk into a room so he can catch you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Agnes, you're a lifesaver. Oh, uh, what kind of housewife would I be if I didn't have a gourmet meal for four just lying about the place? <laughs> Not that Ralph ever wants to eat anything other than baked beans, which explains a lot about his personal appeal, mind you, Eric. And many mouths make good gossip. You're so naughty. <laughs> Star of the show. Oh, I brought my pet rabbit for your magic act. Take care of him. Mm. Senor Scratchy just loves the stage. He played baby Jesus in last year's Christmas pageant. <laughs> Oh, morning, Dennis. Stick him up. Pew, pew. <laughs> oh, we shall. Can I give you a bit of friendly advice? Is it about the way I'm dressed? Yes, but it's too late for that. <laughs> oh. 
Oh, Wanda. This might help. Eight years. How is anybody doing this sober? <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> Are you sure you don't want an audience volunteer named my husband, Ralph? Oh. <laughs> hey, buddy. Hmm. Hey, because we're all. Stop it. Well, I better get going. That macrame is not going to hitch itself. <laughs> um, uh, do you want me to take that again? You want me to hold the babies? Take it from the top? <laughs> <laughs> Fussy babies, meat buns on stick. Dare you to stay away. <laughs> huh? Lavender. It's supposed to have a calming effect. Ralph sprays it on me every night. But okay, so we get the idea. I'm not saying that that's the case here. And obviously, this is a. The, you know, this is the comedy is is satire. It's you're capturing something that's real and amplifying enough to make it funny. But that doesn't mean it's it. That doesn't mean that it's not capturing something that's actually real. Um, I think we see some of that here, you know, but I saw that even in the bar, too, as sometimes people become you had maybe the popular guy in the social group on the outside and someone is trying to wiggle their way closer to it and they become kind of a guardian of that person i don't know it's uh <laughs> it's something to it's a real thing again i don't want to if i talk about it too much it becomes probably not cool so let me let's so let's go to the interview and I am, unfortunately, sometimes, I don't know if it's coming through on your end, but sometimes there's moments of where, where the audio cuts out. I'm not sure what's causing that. It's not too bad, but we'll have to just kind of put up with it. Some pieces, but other than that, I don't know much. I know he's a great guy. I know he didn't get the justice that he deserved. All right, so this is the beginning right before he introduces. Now, I have it on high speed, and I'm sorry, because that does maybe do a little bit of an injustice to the way they talk. Um, so I apologize for that to Joan and to Sean. Um, but just also keep in mind, all right, so we just said justice, uh, that John did not get the justice that he deserved. Well, again, so there hasn't been a trial yet, right? So you're just starting right out of the gate with just that kind of biasness right there. Uh, someone is charged with the crime. And so I don't know why we would say, I mean, if that person is proved guilty in a court of law, then he does get the justice. So um, just a little bit about my uh, guest tonight. During the uh, end of the summer, I guess probably the end of the summer, um, Joan is her name. She reached out to me, and she had told me that, uh, did you know that John lived in the Ponca Park area before moving up to Meadows? I said, I had no idea. So we started a conversation, and we basically talked for a long time, sharing stories and you know, putting things together. So um, I just thought tonight, uh, in light of all the things that are going on, because let's face it, I don't know about you people, but I'm drained. Um, we've been at this a long time. All right? In, 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 in time-wise, it's not a lot. But look at Karen. She's been dealing with this for over two years. But it's uh, you get drained, all right? And we're battling. So I sympathize with that. It is training. I mean, I know I don't know about you guys, but a lot of us really just wish this case was over. And at this point, we're just kind of hanging in there because we feel like we've taken it this far and we have to. Um, we've got to see it through to the end. And obviously the families, they're the ones that are truly going through an agony in this, whether it's Karen's family, the O'Keefe family, the McCabe's, the Alberts, the Nagels, uh, so many other people that have been falsely accused of participating in a murder, um, the Proctors. I mean, it's just, um, it's an agony for so many people. But all right, let me jump forward a little bit. Him was uh, in 2012, and I had a birthday party. It was a hurricane um, in 2012 in the Boston River. Yeah. We lost power. 
Awesome. So some of my neighbors literally lost power so they could become my house washi. They, if people had things that needed to stay frozen, I was putting people's stuff in my freezer. So, you know, to say, I mean, this is what you do in Bonnie, you know, we no. all do it. So, no, that's like down here, I can tell you that. 17 days without power. Oh gosh. 95 degree weather. No, oh, that's no. Horrible. I would have gotten yeah. the car driven. Well, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, no, I mean, so you first met John, right? Yeah. Uh, he shows up in my backyard with Kaylee. Like, right, cops act like cops, right? I mean, did he act like a cop or was he just, did no. he blend in? Oh, no, no. Blend right in. He blends right in. He was also, yeah. he showed up with um, his niece Kaylee because Kristen had work and she wouldn't pick up Patrick afterwards. But so just for the people out there that don't know, so uh, Kristen was John's sister who died of cancer uh, 2000, I'm not 14, maybe, I think 2014. And the, the kids were young. Uh, John was very close to his sister. John, the sister is the oldest, and then John, and then there's the younger brother, Paul. So there's the three of them. The parents are still alive. The, and one thing that everybody on all sides agree with is that all five people of the family are very close and very loving and were very protective of Kristen's two kids, nephew and niece. Um, shortly after, uh, two months after uh, Kristen died of cancer, Kristen's husband had a heart attack, unexpected, died. So now the kids were orphans. And John was, uh, was a Boston cop unmarried and uh single and he stepped in gave up the bachelor lifestyle and said i'm going to raise these kids and it was a but it was a team effort it was a family effort we were told by the free karen reed crowd for a long time falsely that there was some kind of battle between john and his parents for control no just another fiction so just keep in mind that yes this interview is going to take the position as though they care about the families but a lot of harm has been done and is being done to the o'keefe family from people like this i hate to say it but now chris uh joan became friends with john after john moved and became the uh the father to the kids basically and uh, she is someone that was involved with, I guess, running the neighborhood pool. She's involved with activities and that kind of thing. She did know the McCabe's, had no history of animosity with them at all. Uh, which so, so you'll see where this goes, but um, no history at all of that. And she moved out of Ken in i fail with year but i think maybe 2016 or something like that so she was long gone when karen started date when john started dating karen because uh karen and john were dating for only for the two year for the two year period before john died so joe may have met karen a couple of times in coming back to canton to visit but they, they didn't know each other and so all the stuff that joan is going to say and there's a lot in this interview about how karen's relationship was with john or with the kids or things they were doing or weren't doing that's all stuff that karen has only told john in the last year or so when joan joan didn't have karen's number before that and it was only when she started getting involved in in this case that she reached out to Karen, I think initially through a social media platform. And then they got, and then Karen gave her a number and they got in touch. And since then, you know, Joan has been to Karen's house in, well, to her parents' house in Dighton. Um, so she's kind of part of Karen's team now. And you have to keep that in mind. Now, again, that doesn't mean that Joan doesn't believe this stuff, but a lot of the stuff that she's saying here, whether it's true or not, was fed to her only in the last year by Karen. And that's just the truth. You know, he shows up to take his niece because that's what JJ did. You know, he jumped in um, prior to moving to the Pocopog neighborhood. She had a condo and had sold it, a townhouse and had sold it and had lived with her brother um, and her husband and her daughter until they could move into their new house. So mm -hmm. just, you know, a good solid brother. You know, that's what, to me, that's what family's all about. You're supposed to help each other. These things you do. And to me, it was, it was a natural thing for JJ to just do that. To, and he loved his hood when she got sick. Everybody just, they were so aware of her and her family. And, uh, you know, then she passed and... You know, it, had to be devastating. It. Had to I mean, it had to be devastating, you know, for the whole, I mean, not just for the family, for the whole neighborhood. Yep. She seemed to be, you know, infectious for the, yep. for the whole neighborhood, right? It had yep. to be devastating. Everybody, like I said, everybody who met her loved her. She at one point became a member of, um, the, we, have a, we have a neighborhood club, it's still there, the Ponca Park Civic Association. Oh, and right. she sat on the board for a little while. 
um, until she got sick. So, you know, she was, so she got sick, it was the end of May and had the surgery and then she passed away on November 11th. Jesus, wow. It was, it was quick, you know, and she thought she had shaken it and evidently within like a week we learned that she didn't. So her husband, Steve, you know, I think everybody had a hard time and, you know, juggling work and the hospital and her parents were unbelievable. Like her mother and father were there every day. Her mother was making dinner. She was cleaning. She was cleaning. She was the shoulder that Kristen cried on. You know, <laughs> the pain was excruciating. Um, so again, and so Joan is doing a good job here pointing out that the entire family got together and you know john and and played a huge role in trying to raise these kids and the mother was there all the time and the father is affectionately called papa um but you'll see those signs of this year too like joan is calling him papa but she shouldn't be she's not part of the family and that's one of those little kind of things signs here that that i look for as a bartender that someone's trying to put them insert themselves in the center of events where they don't belong and there'll be more signs of it seem to be any you know loneliness it seems like there was always family around yeah. to yeah. pick up that you know that no, it was only I, listen, I had friends that lost their parents like a father you know after everyone leaves i have you know my own friend he was uh, 12. Yeah. he was by himself uh, he was the only child but his mother's oh. you know working and yeah. so it seemed like Kids had a, a huge support system, yeah. not only no, the family, but within the neighborhood. You couldn't beat it. You could not right. beat it. Um, right. Even Kristen had one of her cousins that summer. Um, she had already prearranged for her to babysit the kids over the summer. So she kept the kids. So she took them to different things during the summer. She had them at the pool. Um, she was great. Like Even the cousin was great. Wow. So, um, you know, I think in some ways, some people could be envious of how amazing this family was in such a horrible time. Yeah. So I will say that, you know, a group came together through all of this. And it was Kristen had her friends from Braintree High School and from uh, Providence College. Mm -hmm. And Steve, he was from Framingham. So he had his Framingham crowd. And he had, oh, gosh. I think he finished his college education at Emerson. And I oh, can't remember where he started, but I know he played soccer. Oh, so right. we had like this, the two of them had like this unbelievable group of friends. Like just, well, Kristen was super outgoing. And like I said, everybody loved her. Um, and JJ was, he wasn't like the outgoing that Kristen was, but he was out there, you know? Right, right. So she might have been attended outgoing and he was in eight, you know, or seven and a half. Sure, right. Um, but just a great guy. So with all these people came together and all the Canton friends came together in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm and organized this huge fundraiser. And I don't think when everybody started, I don't think any of us realized how big it was going to get that they had to move the event to a different location because the numbers were just so big. That's amazing, that's great. So um, I don't know if you remember the name Jim Plunkett. Oh, of course. So you can see this is one of those situations where a, a kind of big social world had developed here around the need to help this family, which is great. And it speaks really well of Ken. And it's a difficult thing because you know, you don't want to, you don't necessarily want to look too closely into people's motivations when they're trying to help, right? Um, it doesn't necessarily require that deep of introspection, to, but there are in that circumstances, there's, it produces a need. You know, there are some people that will be drawn to that and want to get close to the circle, to the inner circle, because you got this big now group of hundreds of people outside that are following this thing and every it's the focus of everybody's energy to need to help this family it's a draw to some people to want to be at the our events to be at the inner circle to be part of the family even if you're not to be calling the family calling the, you know the father papa and things like that it's it's a little bit unusual to be doing stuff like that i don't call anybody else papa or daddy <laughs> for you turtle riders i don't call anybody any name like that except for my own father you know so i mean i don't know, maybe some of you guys do but Kristen truly attracted strong people because we all had strong personalities and right. jj just managed to keep everybody focused on and it wasn't just that i think everybody ultimately the focus was we need to do this for Kristen and steve oh. um we need to do this for the kids you know um it was it was beautifully done i think everybody had a great time when i look at the photos i just see people were just laughing smiling um, it was great. Yeah. Was JJ a prankster? I mean, did he have a funny side to him? Uh, or was he um, all business or serious? Well, he was not all business. He was not okay. all business. Um, like I said, sarcasm, I think, is the word that runs in their family. Okay. <laughs> Cracking some jokes. Yeah. Okay. Cracking all some right. jokes, like the looks on the side of your face. Um, but I will tell you, I would, if you did something wrong, um, JJ would definitely call you like, really? Don't really? <laughs> like, right. thanks. You know, I'm like, oh my God. So, um, but Kristen was pretty good at that too. Like she'd call you out on something. Um, and they both had a great way about them. So you never felt like, oh, God, I'm a loser. They just, they just were. So again, just a comment. I like these questions by Sean. I mean, I think he's he he is doing a good job or has a gift to how to per, how to personalize people, and he is trying to do that. But there's a disconnect where he doesn't seem to understand that when he you you only you only see hints of it in this interview here, but things that have been done that have done great damage to other people, such as the 
the near constant attacks on Paul and the accusations that the brother Paul was part of the conspiracy. So there's a disconnect. On the one side, you're celebrating the humanity and and doing a great job in the interview, and that's where it's that's one of the things that had me feel down uh, watching this because I see the potential of Sean, you know, but he doesn't seem to have that filter that is telling him you're accusing innocent people of crimes for no reason and just doing very kind of randomly. There was no reason to ever accuse Paul of being part of the conspiracy, except that he needed to. When, 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 um, when I was talking to him on the phone at the end of the summer, and I've told you guys this story before, but for anybody new here, so that we were going over the video and Sean was, this is the video of, of Karen backing into John's car in the driveway. And so Sean looked at this and said, now the police later inspected it and found not a scratch on John's car. Now, I would say the reason for that is because Karen only nudged it. She barely touched it. She did touch it, but it only nudged it. But for Sean, it bothered him. So he came up with the theory, and I'm not sure if other people believe it too, like, say, this Peter Murphy guy, but that they whisked away that car the day of the murder and brought it to an auto body shop so they could get rid of any sign of the damage. So, again, you're starting to see here. This is to, you have to, these people have to believe in a lot, a lot of incredibly unlikely things to make this conspiracy happen. And it doesn't stop to give them pause to say, geez, am I really accusing innocent people of being com uh, complicit in a murder conspiracy based on these incredibly unlikely things? He doesn't stop to do that. So this is where you have to say it's because he has his own, he's getting something out of this case. He's getting something personal out of this case and he doesn't want to give it up. So when I asked him that, how, how you know, I, 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 so I, when they said that, when he said that they wished away John's car, I said, you mean to tell me that with the fa grieving family inside and a blizzard going on, nobody noticed that John's car was missing from the driveway? I mean, it would, it would take several hours to do that auto body work. Thought about it, and he said, it was Paul, John's brother. Paul was part of the conspiracy. Now, this it's ridiculous. There's never been any evidence of anything that, that you could look to point to Paul, other than there was a need to say there had to be some family member that was involved here, otherwise... They would wonder where the where the thing was, where the you know how. Otherwise, the family would say, "How could? Where's the car? Why is it missing?" You know. So they had to come up with some explanation, and this went on for months. It wasn't just a random thing where you may, where you come up with a crazy theory, then you say, "You know, I don't want to go down that road." No, he pursued this for months, and I blocked him in January. So he first told me this September, and I blocked him in. Jan I told actually told me August, late August, and I blocked him in January when he started going after Paul, and. So you just got to remember, if you're going to be sympathetic to the family, but at the same time, you're attacking them and accusing them of being part of a conspiracy to kill their brother or ignoring a conspiracy to kill their son, you got to keep this stuff in mind. People, That's part know? of the story. So, so, I, will tell you that I didn't mention Paul to you. So, Paul, no, my first, right, right. so, you know, you go through all this and um, Paul had the two little girls and he was, to me, I always thought of Paul was the quiet one. Um, right. And... I almost wonder sometimes if he might have been quiet because he was the youngest and he had such outgoing older siblings and he kind of watched. I don't know. Sorry, but about when the cut he was out. doing all that fundraising stuff, John went on TV with Maria. Oh, shoot. She used to do the news on um, Channel 25. Stephanos? Stephanos, yes. National yeah, Channel 25 yeah. in Boston. Okay. Um, so the two of them went on with her along with Steve's brother mm -hmm. to talk about the fundraiser. And it's just like she's trying to like get it going, the, the interview process. I'll you skip know, ahead, but again, I can't do anything about so the well, cutouts. Um, it's easy to live with. You, sure. know, you know what to expect at all times. Um, the house was always immaculate. Um, know, yeah. he, was, he was just great with them. As far as like their schedules, like getting them places. One of my, one of the old friends in the neighborhood used to say, JJ is the best dance mom and ever. Like hands down the best dance mom. And it was just it's like if they had to be somewhere, whether it be a sport or a dance, and it's like, oh, they're supposed to be here. And, and JJ's like, no, they're not. They're supposed <laughs> to be there at this time. And they're going here instead because he changed it. And so he really kept on top of it. And you got to notice that she always calls him JJ, but, and she'll address this after, but this is, this was really the, maybe the first sign for me that something was not right. Um, only his family calls him that. And she's not in the family. Of every right, little detail. Right. That's important. Structure. So, structure, is important. structure is huge. Yeah. So, um, you know, he, he kept them in the home that they lived in with their parents, you know, in some consistency. Sure. They had and, their own bed. They had their own bed. They had their own bed. Yep. So, so after a while, um, I think it was a couple of years. So I had moved from Canton in 2016. So he probably moved the year after over to Meadows. To Meadows. So, oh, before, I, we get to there, before we get there, John, I just want yep. the only person you haven't talked to now, you had a very endearing uh, name for Mr. O'Keefe. Can you talk about Mr. O'Keefe? What did you used to call Mr. O'Keefe? I called Mr. O'Keefe Papa. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. He's awesome. Awesome. It's a wonderful man, you know. Yeah. So it's, it's, think, um, it's, it's hard to see Mr. O'Keefe. Oh my gosh! Every time oh I see God. him, and you feel like so you live in here, and you know life's not supposed to be about regrets. And I do. You question things, um, but things have been different if I stayed. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I hope it would have been. Right. Um, 
I don't know. You just don't know. Right. Um, he just let us be loved. <sighs> wow. I mean, this was another wild wow moment. She's things would have been different if she stayed in Canton. So somehow, if she stayed in Canton, then then Karen wouldn't have dropped him off at that party. I, it, that's just a a mind blowing thing to say. Mind blowing. Loved those kids more than anything. Right. So he yeah. would give them anything. But you know. <laughs> but, but before we move on, I, I want to tell the audience you were very close because I believe you told me way back when that when uh, when the, the kid's father passed, yeah. he came to you, right? And he brought he bring Kayla to you, uh, the kids to you. He brought the kids to me. Like, oh, like that's morning. important to know. Uh, so and um, that got to be a shock for you. Well, at first, when he shows up, the kids were in the in the car, and he's knocking on my back door at eight o'clock on a Sunday morning, which is not bad. Yeah. And I get the door, and I'm like, "Hey, you know what's going on?" And he says, "Steve's gone." Um, and I'm like, Wait, uh, so my first processing is, you know, Dr. Dr. Ask, how could he do this? You know, your uh, brain's going a mile a minute. Sure. And then he says, he's dead. Oh, and um, he's like, the kids are in the car in their pajamas. The fight department's on their way. Can you oh, bring the kids in? And you're like, absolutely. So the kids come in and they're like, hey, Joe, I didn't know we're coming up this morning. I'm like, oh, we talked about making pancakes. And, oh, you know, oh. when Kristen died, I, our community um, in the school tried to put everything in place to ensure things were okay at school for her, like her teachers and um, everybody there. And then to have Steve die two days, two months later, two months and a day later, um, you know, I, I remember escaping to the basement. So again, sorry about the little patches of silence that come in, but um, so there's no question that she was close to uh, Kristen and Steve. And at this point in the story, John, I don't even know if she knew John, but John has not had to move in and take over the family yet. Um, to call the principal on a Sunday morning and right. he didn't answer. And they like, oh, maybe somebody's water pipe broke and you know, what do you do? It's it's family, right? No, 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 no. So right. um, yeah, so it's, it's, been, it's been a crazy time, you know, crazy yeah. time. So um, but so more JJ? Well, yeah, before we transition, before I mean, obviously you got to see some some of uh, JJ's activities as a dad in the neighborhood. Yeah. So just, what was JJ, Mr. Mom, like with the kids and interacting with other neighbors? We had some famous neighbors in the in the in the, uh, in, the in the neighborhood, I guess, right? Yeah. A couple so that are famous today, right? Uh, what Sean means by famous neighbors are people that he says are conspirators. Yes. Um, so JJ was just a friendly guy, and yeah. you know, it's a. Uh, it was like he became a magnet of sorts. You know, right. going through this in the neighborhood cities, Kristen's great brother moving in and how great and how could, and he had personality. So how could you not like him? You know, he single, was, single, he was single. He was funny. He was and, kind. Uh, you know, um, he's standing up as a single guy, right? Yep. Not married. Yep. A Boston police officer. And, yep. and this has got to be a huge thing for women, even for guys to say, this guy in the prime of his life, taking on his niece and nephew and raising them. That had yep. to be like, wow. Yeah. So when people finally did go to work, um, he, he did go back to work. Mm -hmm. um, I guess like, the community again, like, there were, there's a family down the street and just around the corner from them and their oldest son, um, it's, I think that everybody probably, we all read the stuff online, it's sucking the life out of everybody. Sure, you know, right. What's going on makes people angry. And um, I think this really needs to be, um, well, this first portion, anybody really needs to be a focus on um, the family and how good they were sure, and John. Exactly. And right. um, I will say, you know, over the years, I've met some of the girls John dated. Okay. And um, they were all, for the most part, they were all very nice. You mm -hmm. know, um, he always attracted women, um, athletic women, you know, women that were solid, you know. Um, okay. I would not be <laughs> the whole thing. No? Type. Mm -hmm. oh, he, okay. liked, he liked his um, slight athletic guys. Petite? Petite. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. he was a thin guy. So, you know, you yeah. think about it when you're attracted to people, like you're often attracted to your own type. And so yeah. he, being tall and thin, was pretty much attracted to the same type of women. Um, right. I will. So prior to his passing, I had met Karen a few times. Okay. And, um, you know, if people would ask me, you know, what was she like? And other people had met her. And I have to be honest, I thought she was a breath of fresh air. You thought so, she was going to be the one? Did you think I she was going to be the one? I thought she was going to be the one. I really? had hoped she was going to be the one. You wow. know, he'd walk in to get to pick up his niece to go somewhere, and like everything was all packed, everything was organized. You know, wow. um, you know, make sure she was okay. Um, just warm. You know, sure. he walked into that house, and it was it was easy. It was warm. Um, right. So I think when with John, when he moved into that house, I had moved away, and when I would you know, yeah, again, sorry, this I don't know if this is on Sean's end or my end, but I get these cutouts on this video. When I hear, you know, what's going on, and you know, oh, Karen's, you know. She's got um the kids. She's taking the kids out, and she's you know got some of your friends with them. So she right. would go off and do you know activities with the kids and have their friends with them. Or there was a sleepover. You know, Jay is away, and the kids have a sleepover, and Karen's home with the kids, and their friends are sleeping over. Right. So um, yeah. And that's admirable too, because Karen's young, single. You know, yeah. obviously, you know. But she... that's what, when you love somebody, those are the things you don't even think about it. That's Absolutely. just what you do. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So you know, you, this is see, this is so good for uh, for background. It really is yeah. to, to yeah. understand that yeah. you know we're looking at a snapshot, right? Of yeah. Karen and John, but we don't get the whole the whole you know thirty thousand foot picture of everything. Yeah. I mean, this is so good to have. Uh, for the 20, almost 3,000 people that are watching right now. So I, I, I told you, but, but see what I'm saying? We got 3,000 people that probably never ever knew anything about this. And I thank God that we, we have you here to yeah. shine some light on this on this story. Sean, the whole thing, it stinks for both families. It truly really does. It stinks for her family. It stinks for the Oki family. Um, Karen's dad is, so I was in public accounting. Sure. And her dad was at Bentley for years. The man mm -hmm. is brilliant. He's so well-respected. I mean, she's so smart herself. Um, sure. So she used to teach at Bentley herself. And there were times when, 
like say JJ had something going on and say Karen's teaching a class on, I think she used to teach on Thursdays. She would take Patrick with her while she was teaching this night class. And okay. he would like sit to the side and do something on his computer. Um, but she did it. And, and Patrick would just, you know, a family. What a, what a role model. I mean, really, I mean, I would, as a kid. I would. You know, again, Joan would only know that from Karen telling her that in the last year. Now, I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm, it probably did. Um, you could probably spin it different ways, taking a kid to a, a very small kid to, to night school with you that your class you're teaching. But, you know, I, there's, there's realities that go in with raising kids, so I'm not being critical of that at all. And I do think there's, there's, there's certainly, whatever we think of this interview here, there's going to be snapshots of truth that are important for people to see and it's good to see uh, about people's lives, about John's life, about the family's life. I yeah. love that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So you get I mean, like, the fact that he went and he sat yeah. while yeah. she taught a class. Yeah. I mean, right. it's just a good boy, you know? A really yeah. good boy. Yeah. And obviously, there's a lot of trust there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, with those four kids, you lose your mother. Now you lose yeah. your dad. Yeah. You know, and just like I said, I mean, obviously, there was a lot of trust built up. Yeah. And uh, that's a credit to Karen. It really is. And yeah. obviously, obviously, Jay, I love the fact that we have now uh, put to bed, right? That people that knew John, JJ, yeah. called him JJ. Because it's always like, you know. Some of his friends do, not many. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of a small group. And JJ once said to me, he goes, you know, John, nickname JJ is a family name. And I'm like, yeah, JJ. Yeah. Okay. So are you saying. So maybe we'll repeat that there and slow down the speed a little bit because this to me is. We'll put this at normal speed. Because I think it's kind of interesting. It's a Karen. It really is. And yeah. obviously, obviously, Jade, I love the fact that you we have now uh, put to bed, right? That he, people that knew John, JJ, yeah. called him JJ. Because it's so, always like, you know. Some of his friends do, not many. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of a small group. And JJ yeah. once said to me, he goes, you know, Joan, the nickname JJ is a family name. And I'm like, yeah, JJ. So JJ, so John, very gently in his way, told her, you shouldn't be calling JJ. That's just for my family to call me that. And she didn't accept that. And she said, yeah, okay, JJ. But not only that, but she wants us to know this. This is like, in a, so she wants us to know, wants everybody to know how close she was to John. And again, back to that video that I showed at the beginning from that TV show. I, you know, I, I can't, I see, si, I, th this was something that I saw at the beginning when I first watched this. And I was like, hmm, that looks like a sign of something to me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so are you saying it was more of a family? A it was more of a family. Yeah. And um, I would say like some friends maybe he grew up with in Braintree right. might know of that because of the family yeah. calling him that. Yeah. So I, so. yes, I, I know, I know. We so family and friends that he grew up with and Joan. Those are the only ones that get to call him JJ. I want to keep having pause. I don't want to bring this up for anything else. Just to just to tell uh, our three thousand over three thousand people that when John moved into Ponky, right? Yeah. Jen McCabe and Matt were neighbors of you and John. Yeah, they lived. Right? So there was a previous. I mean, there was a relationship back then, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. If you've heard the whole interview, even though he says the goal here is to keep it positive. The goal is to do the first half positive and then start angling everybody towards the conspiracy. Make no mistake, that was the goal from before it started. So, well, I mean, so, it's good to know this because yeah. that's another part we don't know. We just think that, you know, Jen just shows up at a, at a restaurant, you know, CJ, I mean, uh, the waterfall. But yeah. they had years of knowing each other. Yep. So I mean, they and lived right down the street. On sleepovers and yep. meals and, you know. Bringing, I'm sure, lasagna or cookies or, you know, whatever, like mothers do. She yeah. was a mom, four kids herself, four daughters. Yeah. I mean, I'm just saying that that it's good to know this. It really is because yeah. we get to see the humans. So uh, I guess Joan's daughter, I don't know, you know although Joan's my age, so maybe I, I don't know if I got this right, so, but Joan's daughter was – close to yeah i'm not sure i was going to say it was close to 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 the the niece there kristen's daughter but i'm not i think that's the case but i'm not sure maybe maybe joan maybe joan 
had a child at an older age. I'm not sure. But we know that Jen's daughters, Jen has four daughters, were close to, were close not only to, um, well, they were close, to, the the daughters were close to, to um, I'm not going to say her name, but uh, the, nef the niece, but also Jen herself was very close to it. And it's just human nature in situations like this for a certain amount of potentially territorial behavior to develop and it's not even necessarily the case that both sides are aware of it but someone that's calling john jj even though he doesn't want to be might not might might not be happy that john's niece was growing was growing close to jen and that jen was having a large role that she still has to this day with her and, it, and there's no way that Joan could have even competed with that because she moved away in 2016. But that doesn't mean she didn't feel a loss there. So, I mean, and I'm, I'm trying to human, I, we don't know, and I'm not, I, you know, don't know the truth here. We're always trying to get a snapshot. We're looking for clues and you don't want to be unfair to someone. So, all right, let me jump ahead to another point on this it was pretty she's angry she's bitter um i understand there's no, there's no closure no no angry like what could have, you know why 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 no, no. and then you've got the opposite side of karen who loves this guy and you know i knew that they had been fixing up her house um right. doing all kinds of work on it um, and the game plan was to sell her house eventually right. because they were going to buy like a, a vacation home for them and the kids. Okay. Is there any proof of this outside? Does she know of this before? She's going to give a lot of stuff here about how their plans were to get married. Their plans were to, for Karen to sell her house and they'd buy one big house or something like this. Were these Karen's plans or were they Karen's and John's plans? Because according to Natalie, this was the real heart of the problem, is that John had no intention of getting married. And John had told many people for a long time he would never get married. And he told Karen he wasn't going to get married. So, and Joan didn't really know that Karen back then. So this is obviously something that Karen has told Joan in the last year, and she's going to present it to us as though it's a fact. And John's not going to question it. It's like, do they get a lake house? Do they get a sure. beach house? Um, right. To me, Sean, there was a plan. There was. There was yeah, that's what I'm saying. Right. Right. So, um, and I just don't know if everybody knows all of that. Right. And um, like, so I will admit, I have seen the inside of her house. Sure. And it's it's been a, a while back. Um, it's like a shrine to John. So I mean, just. I'm not taking it away. I'm not, I, I don't, would never want to take away Karen's memories or whether we know that that's a demonstration or whether it's sincere, I, you know, who, who knows? But I just want to point out that Joan did not have Karen's phone number until this case. And yet now she's been to Dighton to visit the shrine. And Dighton is 40 minutes away, 45 minutes away from Ken. So Joan has really inserted herself into this case here, a case in which the O'Keefe family, who she claims to care about, does not at all side with. The O'Keefe family was there that day in the house, and they became suspicious based on what they saw in Karen's behavior that day. Really? Wow. So, like, there's a section house where it's all pictures of him, pictures of the kids. Um, pictures of them together and hmm. through all of this craziness she still loves him. like to me she yeah. still loved him she was going through so much crap and this this whole ugliness and that she still loved him well if you talk about closure she never even got to she, say goodbye no. mourn no i mean think about that i think she's gonna get bad seed here uh, other neighbor who lived two doors down from me, her husband died a month later. 
a month and a day later. And you're like, okay, is it me? Like, am I taboo here? So when my mom was diagnosed with cancer, she was at the, um, the BI. And, you know, I went to see her one morning early. I'm going home and Kristen's mom calls me and she's asking how my mom is and, you know, she's in the hospital and where is she? And I said, BI. And she was very upset because her sister had been admitted there and was sick as well with the same exact cancer Kristen had. Okay. So, um, so it was, you know, Papa's, John's sister. And Peg loved her sister-in-law. She was just sweet, wow. kind woman. And so my mom has this retired nurse and there's a woman in the next bed over who had just been, you know, moved into the room with her. My mother says to me, she doesn't sound good over there. I think she's going to get sick. You need to go over there and take care of her. So, you know, mm -hmm. when your mother tells you to do something, it doesn't matter how old you are, you jump and you do oh. it. So this was basically a story where um, Joan's mom is in the hospital and she, she's visiting her and her mom's a nurse and her mom points out that the other person in the room doesn't sound good. Go take care of her. Well, it turned out that this other person in the other bed was uh, John's aunt. And then she runs into the O'Keefe family in the hospital. I don't know. It's a little bit. Let's move on. Door. And then on top of it, you have a blizzard. Right. So, you know. You guys must have got part of that snow, right? I mean, because it came up the Did Northeast, you right? For that one? Probably. Um, oh, God. No, I don't think we got snow for that really? one. Really? Wow. Yeah, I think we missed it. Um, we got some at the beginning of January that month, but not for then, no. Um, right. So, oh, uh, crazy. Yeah. So did you eventually call Karen? Did you get a chance to talk to Karen at all? So um, it took a while because okay. I didn't have her number. Okay. So um, you know how you just have a gut feeling? Right. And my gut feeling was something wasn't right. Okay. Well, I, I, I'll try to touch on this or get to this part after too. But so this gut feeling that Joan had, and so I'm not saying that her feeling is right or wrong. She had since the, well, at least according to her description here, was a gut feeling that she had all the way back to the time of John's death. So it was not based on the conspiracy theory that came out uh, year, over a year later. So let's learn. And, uh, but but had you eventually that. learned that Karen was charged in John's Oh, murder? yeah. 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 I learned a few days later and I watched the hair her being charged and I was like, this is crazy. This is just crazy. Like this is not normal. This is should not be happening. Um, I think for a lot of people going through this, I mean, I freaked because right. Sean, honestly, the situation she was in to me, I felt like that could have been me. True. That's that true. could have been me. Right. I could have dropped him off. You know, had I still right. been living there, I could have been the one in court with my hands behind my back. That was another just mic drop moment to me. And Sean is just nodding, of course, because that's how it seems to be in this case with the conspiracy people. They don't have inquisitive minds. They don't question anything. They don't find that odd. Karen was never dating Joan. There's no reason to think that Joan would have ever been out drinking with John at midnight at a bar and would have dropped him off at a party. There's no reason to think that. And it seems extremely unlikely to me. Joan is, what, was uh, what 10 years older than, than John. And that's just a really, really strange statement to make. She's looking at this and seeing herself in Karen. I don't know. I suspect that tells us more about Joan than anything else. But yeah. I looked at her like it was me. Right. And I just did you ever did you ever have the sense that it didn't happen, or did you just think it was just tragic oh, accident? I, honestly, no. Yes. I didn't think she did it. Okay. I thought something didn't smell right. I'm like okay. this in my mind was impossible see i just i don't really you know obviously the way we remember things could be the problem here she's 
talking about this now and she's reliving how she felt back at the shock of learning that John died. She lived down near Washington, D.C. Um, so there would have been very limited information. But she never tells in this interview here, and I don't think she probably could, but what basis that she had for doubting it. Now, we know now why people might have reasons for doubting it or something like that, but what reason would she have for doubting it, the story back then? And she's all she says is a gut feeling. And I don't know what that is, but, you know, gut feelings, I'm, I don't tell you not to trust a gut feeling, but what someone calls a, because sometimes trusting a gut feeling will save your life. But gut feeling can, is also another way of saying, I just don't believe it because it doesn't fit my preconception of something. And I think it's just important to keep that in mind. So she doesn't base any of her feelings on any piece of evidence here. Now, eventually later on, I'm sure when she hears more evidence, you know, over a year later, she does. But at this time, she doesn't. And she and her feelings are, it's not just a gut feeling. She, as we see, she, they're very powerful feelings for her. And in fact, she claims that she skipped the funeral for that reason. Right. Something was not right. This was right. impossible. Right. Okay. So I just, when you see, like, like I said, no relationship is perfect. No couple is perfect. We fight. No. We fight. Um, it happens. You know, nobody wants to fight, but we do. And if anybody says, you know, you should be married. I have so many friends over the years who fought like crazy with their spouses. Sure. And they're still freaking married. I so just closed actually, the other night. They're actually better now than they were when they were younger. Right. They were nightmares when they were younger. And right. they actually both calmed down and, you know. Sure. I just closed the other night that... You know, my wife, Suzanne, would watch these crazy, you know, uh, true crime stuff. And I don't know, but I used to say, you're watching everything, how women kill their husbands or spouses. And it always goes to the phones and the and the texts. I said, Jesus Christ, Suzanne, if I end up dead, you're definitely going to be, you're definitely going to be the subject. She goes, what do you mean? I said, you see the, you see the damn message you leave me? Of I mean, I've never really put much stock in the theory that well of course we know more now since we learned about the text from higgins but to me the fact that couples are fighting yeah especially when they're drinking i never found that unusual either so the only real question is here is why joan is bringing this up because joan the only information that she would have on this is from karen and obviously karen thinks it's important and wanted joan to talk about it today that's the only possible conclusion you have. You know, question is why, right? Um, I don't know. Vice versa. And we laughed yeah. about it. But you're right. You say yeah. thing. You say crazy things. You know, yeah. that doesn't mean I want to kill her or she wants yeah. to kill me. Well, maybe she does. But, you know, listen. It, <laughs> here I go. Listen. Things like that happen. I mean, yeah. let's face it, Aruba was still fresh. It's still a fresh wound, right? Mm -hmm. She probably oh, didn't yeah. feel, you know. I mean, listen, I wasn't there. I can't I can't speak for her, I can't speak yeah. for anyone. But you know me, I know if I was in a situation and you know, listen, memories die slowly. Yeah. And this was just at New Year's, we're now with the 29th. Yeah. I mean, that's a fresh wound. So, and I have uh, to say, Sean. I think people know what happened in in Aruba, and I don't think we necessarily have to go into the details of no, it. No, no. But no, I have to say, though, given what we kind of know of the scenario, yeah. um, John would never, ever, ever have done what he did there unless he was not blotto. He was blotto. He right. was he was drunk. He was. was I mean, I know it was New Year's. Vacation. Whatever we celebrate. Listen. You know, I've done it. He, I mentally, I, I just don't think he was all there. The John we know, the John I know, um, the Karen, Karen was, that was, that was his woman. That was. Yeah, right. Right. And. Let's just pause it for a second. Let's see if we can get caught up with the audio drop there. But, you know. 
she's going to try to suggest that this was kind of a Camelot situation and they were planning their lives together. That's an important part of her narrative here. That does not seem to really be the evidence. That's what Karen's narrative was. Uh, but this testimony from the ne the kids that, that John was ending this and was trying to end this. Um, and John didn't even know about her affair with Higgins. So, and she's the one that went after Higgins, or at least based on Higgins' testimony, not the other way around. So I don't doubt that she went after Higgins as kind of a revenge thing against John because she was angry about what happened in Aruba. But still, the idea that this was, it, it seems clear there's a lot of testimony that the evidence, that the relationship, at least from John's point of view, had run its course. It was time to move on. And she was angry about that. You know, so this is the thing. You're on vacation. You're going from a very cold environment down to the, the yeah. beach, the sun. The sun affects you. I'm going to tell you, right, if you have a couple of cocktails on the beach, he's an oh outgoing God. guy, right? It, John, right. Think about it. It's, it's, nothing to, it's nothing negative. He is a trim, tall man. You know, sure. he's thin. Right. And she's a trim woman. So... I told you this the other night, my mother, right? So my father's from Ireland, and she would always say, you McDonough's, you just like the thin women. <laughs> and and my mother said, you goddamn McDonough's, because we had four boys. We had four yeah. boys and him. And yeah. we, uh, yeah, we kind of always did. That was like our thing. I mean, we were big boys, right? Yeah. But we always kind of like Linda, very petite. And, you know, so anyways, it's just, it's a, it's a thing. It, it's a, yeah. It's a real thing, so. Just let this catch up again. Hopefully that's the only audio problem. So I watch my brothers, I think, are kind of the opposite. They yeah. um, were both kind of athletic. And sure. they were they used to say, we're afraid to date small women. We're afraid we might hurt them. <laughs> and plus, my brothers, they climb around and they kind of hit each other. And, you know, we're kind of a rough and tumble kind of family. Um right. So I think my brothers were all like, yeah, um, you can't do that to a little girl because she could break a bone, you know? Sure, sure, right. <laughs> so, hey, everyone has their taste. So so eventually you talk yeah. to Karen, right? Eventually yeah. you get a hold of Karen. Okay, yep. tell us how that went. Um, I think she was shocked. Um, she actually, I had reached out to her and because I just didn't know how to do it. And she called me and it was probably, I think it was Memorial Day weekend. And okay. she, you know, you could sense the hesitation on the phone with her. And she's like, Joan? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, um, you know, I, I think she knew I don't know how it happened. How, and um, she's like, you believe me. And I'm like, I believed you from the beginning. Wow. So um, but by then you started hearing more of the details right so, so you're I, early... I can tell you though i didn't like the stuff that happened really started to unfold i think june was it june that she got arrested the second time yeah so she got the charges? yeah right yeah, yeah. yeah. so, mm. like, so like i said your initial instinct as a woman said something's not right not right yeah yeah not right what's your not instincts right. what does your instinct say today i just again this is why i really strongly prefer weighing of evidence how could you have any instinct about something that you weren't there for and you don't have any inside information about your instinct from, I don't know how far Washington, D.C. is away, maybe 800, 900 miles or something like that, and your instinct tells you what happened that day? I mean, it just boggles the mind. The same. Right. I mean, yeah. Nothing changed. Right. So, um, you know, I think we can go back and forth, and I can see how the family, you're angry. You lost your son. Right. Sure. Um, he's a great guy. And... Sometimes I think pain, it's, it's, we, you, you kind of get caught. Like it's hard to see things. What's it? You can't see the forest between the, behind the trees or something. Yeah, you can, yeah. um, it's just not easy, but no, um, I, I, mean, Sean, I think I tried to like, so I tell you about how John was OCD, his mother immaculate. So Karen, <laughs> I think I told, if, if you dropped a ravioli on the floor, her house right. is that spotless. You could pick it up and eat it. Yeah. You get off the floor. Yeah. My mother yeah, said, make sure you clean, clean this house so I can eat. All you know, we tied to EA. Um, sure. and you know, my ex-husband, you know, he was he was military intelligence, but he sure. doesn't know any. This is not. So her ex-husband um, was 
military intelligence. That's probably why they moved down there. He didn't get involved in any of this um, civilian stuff. His was definitely military. And he he was so close lipped. Like I had no idea what he did. None. Oh my God. Yeah. Good so, intel um, officer. That's the, those intel officers are tough. They really are. So in my I remember my brother in law saying, We used to think that he might have another job because nobody knew what he was doing. You never know, right? Yeah. That's good. It's tough. Uh, it might be might be hard for somebody like Joan, who has a lot of energy and need to communicate to be married to someone that's kind of keeping things quiet, right? And is that some of what's driving what went on here? You know, I don't know. But I think it's it's important to keep that. I don't maybe in mind. It's not the, certainly not to blame the husband. It's just sometimes a match can create problems that just the way it is. But honestly, that probably made him good at his job because he didn't tell anybody anything. Sure. So your friends down there that they know about the case, yeah. what are their thoughts? Where are they lying on the case? Well, one of the friends shortly after this happened, yeah, he drives the exact same um, Lexus that she does. Okay. And he is about six feet. I think he's like six three, six four. So I had him one day, I'm like, could you stand next to your car for a second? And oh, he's wow. like, yeah. And I said, let's pretend you back up down the driveway, you know. And uh, let's pretend I back up your car down the driveway. Sure. I'm like, where am I going to hit you? And he goes, well, based on the curve of my car, he goes, you're going to get me all right here. He goes, you're going to sure. do a number on my chest. Sure. And I said. I just want to say, I'm going to show you guys a new picture that I have after we're done this. Um, and remind me in chat if I forget. And this is something that could be very important when it comes to looking at the injuries well, what happens if you're bent over and i do and you look up and he's like joan no guy in his right mind stands in that position with their face looking at a bumper coming at them yeah, right so yeah. i was like so you know you kind of start to play you try to see things like could this have happened yeah. um so i used to work out with somebody who i think he's done over 400 forensic investigations wow wow is that right so he's yeah, that's right he's he's a forensic, a he teaches people how to do it here in DC and sure. he would go in for an investigation and he actually warned me. Did he, he goes, she says, is that right to Sean? So this is obviously someone that Sean has talked to too. So this is probably again, similar to like Peter Murphy, this case because of the glare of the spotlight has drawn all kinds of people that have come forward for one reason or another. And it sounds like this is one of those people. Be careful. He's like cops in Massachusetts have reputation. Really? Wow. He goes, you need to lay low. He goes, I mean, this is just seems very bizarre to me. Like <laughs> she needs to lay low. Like she's going to be in danger from the police. A, a woman that's down in Virginia or DC and making an occasional trip up to do God knows what, what is she's in danger from the police? I mean, that's just kind of crazy. Let's just keep away from everybody. It's amazing. And I was wow. like, can you imagine? And then he's like, he said something. He goes, do you remember? And I'm sure you remember, like Charlestown. Oh, God, yeah. It was a code of silence. It was a code exactly. of silence. Exactly. Like, and that is real. I lived in Charlestown. There is, and ha had a murder across the street. And yeah, absolutely. I lived in that key time in the early 90s when there was a lot of stuff going on, too. Well, code of silence. And so, absolutely. And, and that code was broken. I don't remember the year. When um, one of the black police officers was doing a funeral detail on Bunker mm -hmm. Hill. Right. Is that St. Francis up there? I can't remember the, yeah. but um, he was killed in broad daylight yeah. while doing a detail for a funeral and right. somebody broke the code. Somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a tragedy. Yeah. 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 Listen, you know, living in Boston, uh, all our other friends here, it was all about neighborhoods. You stayed in yeah. your neighborhood. It didn't matter if you're yeah. white, black, Hispanic, whatever yeah. you stayed in your neighborhood as a white yeah. living in Tartar, I cross in the uh, Southie. I'm going to get a beating. That, that's yeah. just it. If I go into yeah. the Jamaica plane back then, it was a very Hispanic uh, type neighborhood. I'm going to play in her and it was hard. So they had they had friends as a couple in Canton right. that they did things with, and you know I want to say it was probably shortly before he passed away. They were making like they came back from Aruba, so things right. happen. You know you move on from it. Sure. Yeah, there's there's always going to be that in the back of your head, like oh you know what if what if yeah. what if. But I thought they were moving ahead, and they had made plans. They were supposed to go on vacations. I think they had like two vacations planned to go away sure. with. So there's only one way that Joan could know, or believe that two vacations were planned. And I don't know who plans two vacations ahead of time, but that's her Karen. That's that's the only source for that. That's because that's Karen is trying to get the story out that their life, there was no trouble there and their life was being planned together. 
But that's not the story we're hearing from the other side, from anybody on the other side. And I'm talking about people close to the families from people that are testifying in this case. So Joan is just taking this at face value from what Karen is telling her. And I think it's important that we should question that stuff. Um, let's jump ahead to the Jen McCabe stuff. That's your daughter, right? Oh, no, the yeah. Other, yeah. That's, no, but I, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, if anything dictated, and I do, uh, this just jogged my memory. So if anything dictated their, their their passion for each other that night, I mean, I would have never thought that the Ruba thing would have happened. It looked like they were working yeah. through it, right? Yeah. So one thing you said to me uh, a couple of nights ago, you and listen, we're not we're not here to uh, make any negative things here, mm. but you did notice one time that, you, and let's, let's be honest, you did say Jen was kind of, um, just pause this for a second to make sure the audio is caught up. Not manipulative, but what was the word you used? Kind of, uh, uh, there was a word you used. Persuasive? I think that's a nice way word to use. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll be yeah, the audio cut out, so let me, re let me rewind it just a little bit. Have, uh, uh, there was a word you used. Persuasive? I think that's a nice way word to use. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll be nice. Yeah. So, so again, you know, they're they're telling us that the focus here was going to just be on John and his family and nothing negative. But you'll see where they're really going is somewhere very different. Um, not that there weren't useful things in there to learn about John and his family, but it's always going to go back to the conspiracy. And here we're now going to have to begin to set up Jen McCabe, <laughs> you know, a soccer mom, and turn her into Lex Luthor. Lex Luthor, capable of of persuading or manipulating people into saying things. So the thing is, right? The the the, the, the what my my theory is is that you know they had to instill something in Karen's brain. And to pause it again just to make sure right. to get this thing because we don't know what happened in that car. But you do have a story that you can tell because you were at the house one time in Ponky. How a neighbor came over to drop a kid off, and Jen had said something. Let me just rewind that a little to see what exactly Sean said. She did say Jen was kind of uh, not manipulative, but what was the word you used? Kind of, uh, uh, there was a word you used. Persuasive? I think that's a nice way word to use. Okay, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll be nice. Yeah. So so the thing is, right, the, 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 what my, my theory is, is that, you know, they had to instill something in Karen's brain to get this thing, because we don't know what happened in that car. But you do have a story. So we they've already described here, and I may have fast forwarded through this, but how Karen's dad was a brilliant dean at Bentley College. I'm not saying he's not, but that Karen herself was also brilliant, brilliant. But yet the soccer mom who's never committed any crimes is able to, according to Sean, manipulate her into saying, I did it. Now this was, we this was not Sean's invention. This was in Turtle Boy's theory back in on day one, and remember, Turtle Boy got his entire theory intact from the defense. Okay, so none of that was result of investigative reporting. That was the the journalism aspect of that was they pitched a story to him, and for a couple of days he resisted to see if he could be convinced, but he could see the opportunity in this too, and his eyes got wide. And when that happened, he bought in. But that whole theory came from the defense. And there were things that, there are many points along the conspiracy that was concocted that are very difficult to make sense of. And some of them still to this day, like why you would put John on the lawn, why you would leave him alive. So many things like that don't make sense still. But you can never make this theory perfect but you can at least connect some things and like i said earlier we saw sean trying to concoct the idea that paul was part of the conspiracy in order to explain how the car was whisked away to the auto body shop so this year and very very much like when the, in the delphi case where the defense has to explain how richard allen confessed over the prison phone to his wife you've got to come up with some kind of a theory so sean and turtle boy and the defense have convince themselves or are trying to convince us how can you explain how she was saying that at the scene 
So to, to me, it really never needed explaining, even when I leaned towards the conspiracy, because I'm like, you know, we don't know exactly what she was saying, even though there were several witnesses. Um, what she, but was she, you know, questioning it or whatever? I mean, we don't know exact. And to me, even it always made sense to me that if she knew she did it, that if that the number one task, you never could conceive. If you know that your vehicle has hit somebody, you're never even conceiving that you might be able to suggest that evidence was planted and blah blah blah. You know that that crime scene is going to be matched to your vehicle. So your only hope is to try to avoid, if you, avoid anything larger than a manslaughter charge. So you need to be able to suggest that it was an accident. So I believe then that one of the possible explanations for her, this is when I was fully on the fence and even leaning the other way. I believe that a possible explanation for Karen saying that was that she was playing a role. She is smart. She is a smart woman. And she understood that if I have to, conv the my only hope here is to convince him that it was an accident and that I had no idea what happened. So if you're going to do that, you fully immerse yourself into that role. And what might, what are the, some of the weird things you might do in that role? Well, you might, for instance, say, oh my God, did I do this? Because you're trying to show to the public and eventually to a jury that you didn't do it on purpose. And so you're going the opposite direction of trying to show that you didn't do it because trying to show that you didn't do it would look suspicious. And she's smart enough to know that that was where she was smart enough back then to know that that wasn't going to fly. So to me, I never really necessarily, I it didn't really need explanation for me. There were always all kinds of possible explanations as to why Karen said those things at the scene, but to the defense, to turtle boy, to Sean, they feel they needed an explanation. And so the only way they could come up with it is, you know, kind of similar to the guards in the prison in Delphi forcing Richard Allen to confess to his wife. He's got Jen McCabe, and she has too, manipulating Karen into saying that, which is stunning, right? I mean, I think to most normal people, that would be pretty stunning, the idea of this non-criminal mind at, at 6 o'clock in the morning doing that. It just seems, you know, just woken up. It just seems crazy. But... They feel it was necessary. And so because of that, and because Joan is on board with trying to prove the conspiracy, you're going to see she comes up with a story. That you can tell because you were at the house one time in Ponky, how a neighbor came over to drop a kid off. And Jen had said something. Just tell that story for the people. Because this, uh, I'm looking at you, but I got the audience over here. Think about this and how she really feels about her own self. What she could have done to Karen on this ride back and forth. Go ahead, uh, Joan. Oh. Um, it's okay. I mean, this is the truth. Which I would, we're just talking the truth. So, in all honesty, <laughs> we're just talking the truth. I mean, there's not even a sense of we're, we're just spec. We he's not in the car. There's no recording of what happened in the car. But we're just talking the truth because it's the only truth that could be right. Oh, it's crazy. This is what bothers me. You have in so many other ways a night sky and stuff like that. But you're, you're accusing people of things you have no evidence of. And you're just calling it truth and facts. It's as though you don't understand what truth and facts mean. Okay. Persuasive. To be in persuasive. persuasive. Okay. okay. Hey, um, you know, such and such well, come over to drop, yeah, right. yeah. To drop okay. off their kid. Um, you know, I'm going to offer her a beer. Um, she's going to say no. Um, right. And she's like, watch this. I can get her to do anything. Wow. So um, the person comes in, she drops off her daughter, and she's like, I got to go. And she's like, oh, come on, just one beer. And the person's like, no, no, come on. So the person actually has the beer, and then the person leaves. And she's like, see, I told you I could get her to drink. So, again, this is all a setup, right? And they know that the thing is, is the, the main purpose of this interview is to further the conspiracy. And one of the main things they're trying to present here is to show how manipulative the evil Jan McCabe can be. And so to do that, they've had months to try to come up with some memory or concoct some story that shows how persuasive she can be. And they come up with this beer story. It's lame. It's not believable. It's at best exaggerated. It, 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 this is, if you want to talk about manipulative, this is manipulative. See, see that to me, Trust me, that to me is a very, very telling statement. And Sean doesn't question it. Because why would Sean question anything that possibly interferes 
with this conspiracy theory that has made him prominent, that has allowed him to set up a channel that has thousands of views that he mentioned several times on this, that has allowed him to set up his own uh, merch now, that has made him a superstar. And he's sitting there with a sport jacket on and, instead of lying around in a lounge chair as a retired guy in Florida normally does. This has revitalized him. And I would have liked to have seen that happen, but you've sold your soul in order to do this because you're treating this stuff without any skepticism at all. And it's it's unacceptable. You kind of learn a lesson of what you should and shouldn't do in people's homes. True, true. So you learned that you can't drink there. Right. For fear sure. that you're going to do something wrong. I mean, I'm totally human. I could easily do something wrong. I could easily sure. say the wrong thing. Right. It would, it, was, it would come back to bite me. Right. So... So, you know, like I've always said, I mean, you know, to get Karen to make these. Yeah, let's jump ahead to um, the last time when Joan spoke with the O'Keefe family. All right. There were a couple of other things going on and then this, and I was just like. Give it a second to go. You know what? Do you think, you know, we could just be nice if there could be peace and like normalcy for everybody and happiness because right. we all need something right now and uh yeah oh the phone calls oh the text messages yeah so okay now i did see some of the um some of so the pause here for a second just to um explain that so joan had decided before the funeral that that this was a something was wrong here okay that this that karen was not involved in this and she posted something around that time in social media to say that. I don't know what. I don't have a copy of it. It was talked about by the O'Keefe family, and they weren't happy with it. But it's also talked about by Joan here. So that, to me, confirms that there was some post. I don't know exactly what it is. I forget if we'll have it here where it was that they talk about it. We might get this coming up. But if not, that's what she's talking to here. That's what she's referring to. The uh, comments. So do you? when was the last time you had a relationship with the O'Keefe family? Was it the last time I spoke to them was the Monday after John died. Okay. So that long she spoke to Mrs. O'Keefe the Monday after, and ever since she's never looked back. So, I mean, this doesn't, how do you explain it? I mean, because she wasn't close to Karen before this happened. She's not privy to any evidence. She just, she's, 800 miles away and has a gut feeling to me that most likely has an explanation in something else. Some, some of her, some need of her own. Because I believe the day after was when she was arraigned that Tuesday. Right. That's true. And I just couldn't accept it. Could not right. accept it. So who'd you speak to um, on that Monday? Peg? I spoke to his mom. Yeah. Right. Okay. And any, did you say you were sorry or did she, she give you any details or no, no. no. And I, I, I did mention that Karen must be devastated and, and she really didn't want to hear that. So who, who knows what was going on at that point? Any response when you said that Karen must be dead. Any, no response or she, I think she didn't want to hear about it. Yeah. She left it alone. Yeah. Yeah. So, I you know, she, I she did... made it clear. She didn't want to talk about her. Right. Now, I did get some insight um, because of a certain person that provided me information. Uh, this lady, Natalie, I did get to read a beautiful Christmas card that Mr. O'Keefe <clears throat> wrote to Karen. The Christmas he before. called her an Christmas. angel. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. He called her an angel. Yeah. He read that. Yep. And he really, really loved her. Yep. No doubt. Yeah. No question. We don't know what the feelings were between the families back then, but um, I would think that, that it would be normal. And I have no idea that the family looking at John as being in his, what, 46 or something like that probably wanting him to get married and settle down. Um, they've lost their daughter. I mean, that's only normal. I, I don't know if we're taking one little piece of evidence there to show how they felt about Karen back then. Maybe they had strong feelings. I really don't know. But there's a need on the part of Joan and Sean to try to play this up when it doesn't seem like there's any strong feelings now. Let me tell you, not even close. So, yeah. Um, when this happened, I I don't I don't I don't honestly I don't know how he's doing. So every time I see him in court, and you know your heart breaks. It just yeah. such a good man, and he just loved those kids. Yeah. Um. Yeah. You know they both. You know 
they all, everybody loved John. It's not about who loved him. Everybody loved him. His parents loved him. Karen loved him. Um, it's just, it's, it's sad. It's really sad. And I think you could also look at it this way too, that if this shows that there was at least on the, on the part of the parents, there was no friction with Karen. So it's not like they had some reason before John's death, to be angry with her or to have any feeling. So that's all the more powerful an indicator that what they saw that day changed because they fully believe that she's guilty. They have no doubt about that. And that's a, that's a powerful statement in itself on this case among so many others for people that are so sure that there's a conspiracy. It should mean, it should at least give them pause. It should have given them pause from day one that this family doesn't believe it. So Sean, when I like say like the whole police thing and all, um, and I said earlier, like Boston police could not have been any more wonderful to John going through the whole Kristen and everything else thing. Sure. So I think we all, not, not everybody's like this. This is what's going on is not normal. This is not normal. No, no. So it you is can't a, say it, one group is horrible. It, it's not fair because we have so many wonderful police officers and law enforcement right. in this country right. that do their job and they do it well. Right. So you know, it's not fair. It's this whole shit, this this thing, what it's done to policemen in the area, it's not fair to them. Right. Well, I got to tell you, my whole thrust of my participation in this from the get-go was just thinking about that poor officer lying on that snow. Yep. And let's face it, he was dead. I mean, you can sugarcoat it any way you want. Yep. When, when the officer on the scene says he's unresponsive and not breathing and the all the CPR didn't work, I don't care if you're trained or not trained, you're dead. Just before yeah. so for some kind of rule, you have to warm the body up before you can do an actual pronouncement. He was yeah. dead, right? Yeah. And the heinous way that, that I believe, right? Because the evidence, I'm going to tell you right now, I was the first one to say that that evidence did not, was not consistent. The first one to say it, but keep in mind, uh, Sean has told me that he didn't begin, he wasn't even really aware of this case or didn't begin, didn't become interested in this case until Turtle Boy's article on April 18th. So I'm not sure when he's saying I was the first one to question the evidence. He certainly doesn't mean back, you know, a year and a half before that at the time. With him being hit by a car. And I'm, I will, yeah. I will always, I will always stay there. And, and so, then just John, that many... person I told you who does the, um, the forensic Forensi stuff. Forensic investigation. So I told we talked about John's eyes being, um, sure. like black eyes, like, right. like he had been right. beaten up. Sure. Like, really somebody beat the crap out of him sure. and this friend of mine said well this guy that i used to work out with said sure he goes well don't that makes sense when you get hit from behind sure he's like you get what is called raccoon eyes raccoon eyes, right so well, but the thing was i said but john wasn't hit from behind well he, he got a gash from up. behind right yeah but he got a, he was yeah, found he got a gash. up right and exactly. he said now that does not match right no goes, let's pause here so i don't forget and i'll pull i'll i'm gonna pull in that picture that i told you guys about um that this was just taken uh, this morning or yesterday morning. So I got to disconnect from this for a second. All right, let's see if I can, oh, and you know what? I should have set this up better for you guys. Let's get this as big as I can get it. All right. So I asked someone who lives in the area, what I was interested in was the possibility of whether John could have been knocked back and if there was a boulder there that he could have hit his head on. And so this is the picture that she took the other morning. She stopped there and took the picture. Um, it's very hard to tell. I, I should have made this bigger for you. I apologize. I'll do that um, next show maybe. But if you look at this picture, so on the left is an electrical box. And we know John was found 12 feet back from the electrical box. Um, I think the fire hydrant is probably to the right here. I'm not sure. And the curb is, you can't quite catch it in this version of the photo. You can see it in the photo, but I, don't, I might have to. Yeah. Anyways, trust me, the curb is very close there. And you can see. So if you look at the at the um, at the electrical box and move about a I don't know a foot to the right or a couple inches on your screen and then go backwards you'll see a black object and that black object is a boulder and it is 
we don't know exactly where John was found, but we're told 12 feet off the street and behind these things. So this is exactly the area that it would be. So it's there's a very good chance that this could be what happened, that John was knocked, was hit at a high speed by a two-ton SUV. He was hit, probably had the, gla- the cocktail glass in his right hand. That broke the taillight because it clipped it. At, at, it's a good If it's a good heavy-duty piece of cocktail glass and th- the vehicle's going at high speed and that glass and makes contact at an angle that would it clip off the outer piece of the taillight. And then some part of the vehicle, it's all, it all happens fast because the car's moving at speed. So it hits the, it hits the tail, uh, the uh, cocktail glass. And then a microsecond later, it hits the arm and then hits the body and sends that body lurk backwards. I don't want to say launching because that applies he was in the air, but it would have sent John backwards at a high speed. He wasn't staggering back from being hit. He was forced back by the force of the blow. This, now, I don't know what the accident reconstruction theory is, and you guys know I have a. I came up with a different one this fall where John was actually facing forward. Now, I don't know, but this, but it was interesting. So I, if if John was struck in, we know that the, the, the according to the, charging document there is trauma damage to the pancreas and i think one of the other internal organs in the midsection there so if he was struck there how did he get the injury on the head and so it's important to explain that did he hit it on the electrical box well that has never seemed likely to me because if he hit it on the electrical box then he would have had to kind of stumble or stagger backwards before collapsing but he was found back in that area with Till glass and with his phone underneath them. So that suggests more to me that he had the phone and the cocktail glass in hand, and those things had the force of momentum, the same exact force that was put on John's body from the strike, and then they came out in flight, but because they had the same momentum on them, they would have ended up in the same spot. I don't think if he hit his head on the electrical box and then staggered back that he would have ended up with the phone and the cocktail glass. That but that's me. I I know nothing I knew I do know about cocktail glasses, but <laughs> that's that's the only thing I'm an expert at. So um you know we'll have to see what the state says, what their accident reconstruction theory is. But it seems to me that's a very plausible thing that he was launched backwards and smashed his head on that boulder. And what would happen if that boulder wasn't there if he didn't hit it? Could he have lived? I mean it's terrible to think about, right? I mean it, it might even explain why Karen might not, if she, if Karen was aware she hit him, she might not believe there was a fatal blow. She couldn't have known that, that he struck his head on something like that boulder, but that boulder is, would have been there all these years. That's a big, it's a, it's a heavy enough boulder that it's not something that was recently moved there. I'd be shocked if it was. And you can also see from this image why it was very hard for anybody walking by during a blizzard, during windy and cold weather to see i mean there's trees back there there's bushes there's there's the flagpole there's the fire hydrant and there's the electrical box and it's a very dark area where there's no street light so this to, you know this to me makes a lot of sense but let's go back to the interview that is wrong right there because if you told me he was found face down Sure. and had the gash in his head and the raccoon eyes he's like i would 100 percent be on board with you he goes but the fact that he was found face up right that's not normal no and um listen there's debates about the theory right of the reconstruction i just don't see how a car can selectively hit and not hit different parts yeah. of the body it doesn't yeah. listen it doesn't pass the intelligence test it, listen it doesn't um but listen you know i, I want to because i don't want to get upset because i played the nice music i didn't do my intro because i really want i really want to keep this low-key like we said, positive, focus on John. But you did come back to Boston, not to Canton, a year later. Let's pause this for a second. Can you tell us yeah. that story? So I did not go to John's funeral. Okay. And my daughter did. Oh, um, really? Because wow. I didn't think it would be appropriate for me to be at his funeral. Given that I did not believe what had happened, oh. I didn't want that kind of attention because right. it should be about John. And it even though you were so bring negative attention, but even though you were so close to him, right? Yep. Still, still, the fact that you 
were known to have believed that, that he was not killed the way yeah. it was told. That still was like a stigma to you. You didn't feel comfortable yeah. enough to attend. Okay. But your daughter did. My daughter so did. That's amazing. That's, a, that's amazing. Well, she, lo wow. she, she loved him. Sure. So right. she thought he was great. He yeah. was good to her. He was good to all of us. Like sure. he, he was just good to every person he was friends with. Sure. Um, right. So, yes, um, I did put it out there anonymously. I will tell everybody. Um, yeah. I put it out there anonymously what had happened last year. And um, I guess I, I was afraid. <laughs> And then um, this past year, for his, at his anniversary, I decided just, you know what, why am I living in fear like this? So sure. I decided to post what had happened and I put my name to it. Okay. So I remember that. Year after John died, I, I need, you know, I think people need closure. Well, I, I had, it was just that one year anniversary and could not stop thinking about it. Uh, so I put the time on this this would have been so uh john died january 29th in 2022 so the one year anniversary with that would be 2023 and that's actually several months before the conspiracy was put out by turtle boy that april so um she would not have been aware of anything like this any of the conspiracy elements she just still had her strong feeling about something not being right and so in on january 29th in that time of year that cold time of year she made kind of a pilgrimage to 34 fairview um having some problems with it and um i don't know if, you know i don't know if it was so when his sister was dying i said to her when that night she died i said could you do me a favor when you're up there could you look out for me because i need a lot of help Right. And um, so when I went to go, I just felt like disappointed her because I probably should have helped the family, helped her. I, I don't know. You don't know. But I go right. to to where he died to pray. Where's Where was and that? I went to the Albert's house. Brian Albert's residence. Brian so Albert's house. To the, the, I went to the, there. Yeah. So okay. actually, I when, when, when was that? Right around the anniversary? It was right around the anniversary. So it was a Friday afternoon, that last Friday in January um, in 2023. So, okay. yeah, so John would have died. I think the anniversary of him would have been Sunday. Yeah, so I right. was there Friday. And I was in town because one of my relatives, their kid was making their confirmation. Right. So I went by to to say a prayer to like, I had to let go. And um, when I went there, you know, I pulled the car up because I had. Sorry about, sorry about the audio cutouts. So okay. actually, I when, 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 when was that? Right around the anniversary? It was right around the anniversary. So it was a Friday afternoon, that last Friday in January um, in 2023. So, okay. yeah, so John would have died. I think the anniversary of him would have been Sunday. Yeah, so I was right. there Friday. And I was in town because one of my relatives, their kid was making their confirmation. Right. So I went by to to say a prayer to like, I had to let go. And um, when I went there, you know, I pulled the car up because I had somebody in the car with me. Okay. And I asked them to wait in the car because in case I was going to cry, I did not want them to see me upset. Sure. Sure. And so I pulled the car up and left it there, walked over. And I didn't go to where John's body was found. I went to, when you look at the house, if you're staring at the house, um, the fire hydrant area is to the left. And right. I stood to the right. And mm -hmm. I stood to the far side of the property where the driveway is. And I stood on the far right of the driveway. Okay. So, and I stood about two feet on the lawn. And it was more because, in all honesty, the person that was in the car, like I said, I didn't want them to see me because 
It's kind of like it's shaky work, there. Well, it's and, personal. Uh, this is a personal thing. Yeah. This is, yeah. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, said a prayer and I don't think of myself as a religious person, but there's, there's, there's just something about this family, you know, and, um, so I go and I do it and I don't recall seeing a car in the driveway. So okay. I feel I'm safe, you know, um, heaven knows they don't have cameras. So I'm safe to go cool. and um, say a prayer. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, um, so I I'm standing there and a gentleman comes out of the house and he yells, Hey, you know, what are you doing there? And I said, I was just saying a prayer. And he's like, why? And I said, cause a friend died here last year. Mm -hmm. And he's like, get out of here. So I left immediately. So hold on. Did you recognize this person? I didn't know who he was. Okay. Like, I didn't know who he was from the beginning, you know? Right. So, so um, you didn't see pictures like during the course of the. Because I really wasn't paying attention to that. Right. I think, right. Um, I don't know if there was a lot of pictures of him early on. Sure. Okay. Right. So I honestly don't know. Um, plus, I'm here. You're there. Um, yeah, I don't recall the whole right. yeah. that part of it being um, going on early on. Seeing was he was he aggressive towards you? He was just, you know, he had a nasty tone, like right. just. So I knew. And I got moving. So right. I hopped in the car and I was about to leave and, you know, fine. And I just kind of need to just chill. So I had a friend who didn't live too far from there. And I stopped by their house to say hi. Okay. And they came outside. It was freezing out. They came outside and we chatted for a little bit. And the person looked over like my shoulder and said, I told her what had happened. Mm -hmm. And she's like, Joan? He's right there at the corner. So he jumped in his car and followed me. Must the car must have been in the garage? Is it you said? Must have been. Yeah, yeah. I'm assuming. Um, because yeah. like I guess I just don't remember a car being in the driveway, you know. Right. So So you thought you were safe, you could go up there, yeah. Him, so I mean, pay your respect. All the time. You right. see crosses right. all over highways, people leaving flowers a year later for somebody's anniversary. Flowers, you know. Right. So I, the person said, yeah, he's right, right there. He's in the car right there at the corner. He's watching you. And so did person, I. Did the person that you were visiting know who that was? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody she, in the town. Well, he, what did he or she say to you? Or um, so I looked over kind of like recognizing the person. And then he moved. He moved his mm. car. So in the type of street that they live on, it's like a short street. So he was at one side, then he like looped around and appeared on the other side, like two houses down. Yeah. And so he's gone from there. And minutes later, she says to me, I think he needs to come in the house. And I'm like, what? She's like, yeah, because he's watching you because now he's at the other corner. And and she said, this is Brian Albert. Um, I think she, I don't think she said his name, but okay. she knew that. I had been there and oh, that okay. I assumed that it was Brian Albert. I'm assuming okay. that it was him. Right. So um, she's like, Joan, have a watching. big guy, stocky guy, Manchu, whatever. Well, in the end, I know it was him. But back okay. then. All oh, right. So, you know, like, okay. That's yeah. Good. And afterwards, right. I was like, oh, that was him. Yeah. Um, so she says, why don't you just come on in? So she comes. I went in 
and um, like maybe five minutes later, knock on the door and the um, police officer says, hi, um, is, you know, is this your car? And she said, no, I have a guest visiting from out of town. That's her car. And, you know, you just don't want to serve crap. So I just got up and I said, you know, got up and I said, hey, I'll just go outside. Thank you. So I went outside and I says, said to the person, hi, my previous name, I'm like, hi, I'm Joan, shook his hand. Um, what can I do for you? And he said, I, were you just over at 34 Fairview? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, what were you doing there? And he introduced himself. He said, I'm, uh, is he a sergeant? Sean Goody. I'm trying to rewind that a little bit. So hopefully it comes through. My previous name, I'm like, hi, I'm Joan, shook his hand. Um, what can I do for you? And he said, I, were you just over at 34 Fairview? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, what were you doing there? And he introduced himself. He said, I'm, uh, is he a sergeant? sergeant. Sean Goody. Sean I'm sorry, Sean Goody. And I'm yeah. like, okay. And he's, were you, and I said, yes. And he goes, what were you doing there? I said, I was saying a prayer. And he's, he was like, for what you know and i'm like he, he was that way too oh he was that way with me and yeah. um i said one, one of the first <laughs> officers on the scene by the way yeah i know he was actually the third officer because i went and yeah. i read the oh yeah the, um, right, the, right. the canton filings afterwards sure. kind of gave me the heebie-jeebies because i found that out after yeah. um he's like what are you doing and i said i was saying a prayer and he's like that's not normal He's like, that is not normal behavior. And, and Sean goes, huh. Like, I mean, it's not normal to show up on someone else's lawn and do a prayer. Now, I don't know, you know, whether the police reacted appropriately, whether they reacted with, you know, the kind of consideration. This is not a dangerous looking person. It's a woman who's in her late 50s. Um, you know, is it necessary to track her down? That seems a little bit like overkill to me. Um, but for Sean to just sit there and act surprised when a cop says that it's not normal to just go trespassing on somebody's lawn and start doing a prayer. And we don't really know what she was doing there. Um, was she just, and she, was, and she wasn't even there. The, she's over near the driveway, right? So she wasn't near the, the, the scene where John died on the other end of the property. But what was she doing? How was she doing her prayers? You know, I, you know, was she doing anything unusual? We, you know, we don't know, right? And I'm not saying that she was, but she, whatever she was doing was enough to draw the homeowner out as it would most homeowners. And, and I just, you know, Sean is, I don't get it. He doesn't even think that it's a little unusual that someone might do this. Yes. And I was like, and I said to him, I'm like, I'm like, I'm sorry. That was a Boston cop, a fellow police officer, you know, died there a year ago. And I was just saying a prayer. He was a friend. And he's like, you're not normal. That's not normal behavior. Jesus Christ. And I said to him, like, it's not normal behavior. You know, you just, I mean, you just show up and walk onto someone's lawn. You didn't have to do that. You could have stayed on the street. You could have sat in your car. You know, or, I mean, it's just to go actually go trespass on somebody's property. It's, it's very strange. And, but this is again, the problem with the people that are grifting on this case, like Sean and pretty much everybody else is that everything gets channeled through the lens of the conspiracy, everything, everything, every police behavior. And no, I, if, I guarantee that two years ago, if you told Sean, if some woman told Sean that she showed up at a house and was trespassing on the property, that he would find it unusual. I guarantee it. People used to walk on my old property all the time. And he's like, that's different. I'm like, kids would come into my neighborhood out of nowhere. Like people just, it happened. And he's like, you're not normal. Like really just, um, so, you know, you keep it together. And I really uh -huh. tried to keep it all together. And then he's like, um, 
I need your ID. Oh, first he goes, is this your car? And I says, no, it's not. Um, he's like, and I, I said, it's my brother's. All right. We'll move and ahead a little bit. Because I was not being charged with anything. Right. True. Sometimes they don't print everything because if it's been a busy. Yeah. So. You know, funny, I, uh, that, and he's oh, yeah, oh I'll have to show it. Uh, John did. Yeah, it's out there. But, you know, it was one of these things where, you know, how how can they be so insensitive, number one? And number two, here's the guy that couldn't come out to see his brother officer on the ground, but he sees you. Again, I find this line of theory offensive to my intelligence. All right. He's just assuming without any question that Brian didn't wake up. Now, maybe you don't believe that, right? That Brian stayed. Maybe you find it suspicious that he stayed in the house. But he's just as treating it as though it's a fact that Brian didn't come out of the house. Now, from what we know, the first responders came in in the middle of a howling blizzard. After all these people in the house have been drinking the night before until relatively late, until at least one or two in the morning. They came in without sirens on, as is the policy in streets like that, in towns like that, including in my town. Uh, so the, we know that there's none of the other neighbors came out of the other houses either. We know that uh, Jen was unable to wake them up and right after it happened. And so she went into the house. Apparently the front door was unlocked and she went up into the bedroom and woke them up. Now, maybe you don't believe that version of the story, but Sean just doesn't have any questioning. That's it. Everything must be 100% certain to fit the theory. I just, I don't find that credible. I, you know, I don't even understand that way of thinking. I don't understand that way of thinking at all. Um, I don't know. I don't get it. And the idea that it's insensitive to be upset with having someone on your lawn doing something unusual to me it's insensitive being on the lawn doing something unusual where something tragic happened without making some connection to the homeowner first and saying hi uh, my name is joan and i'm a friend i was a very close friend of john's i would just like to have a moment here not doing that is insensitive you a woman prank make it the sign of the cross yeah i mean come on right. stop yeah. it so on, on, I think when he came out, like I was looking up to the sun, and oh, uh, yeah. So you're on the lawn oh looking up to just the sun. Crazy. What? I'm I don't sure. think I was doing the. I'm going to be honest. I don't think I was doing the sign of the cross. <laughs> but yeah. um, against I mean, my mother's my Catholic upbringing, I was probably yeah. not doing that. But I was praying and I was looking up to what you know. I think we all look up to the sky. Of course. You so Sean knows this and he's going to try to normal. It's, it's been known for a while that she was doing some kind of ritualistic thing on the lawn. At least that's what we've heard. Sean's heard it too, but he wants to try to normalize it by inserting things about the sign of the cross and stuff like that. At least she has the, the honesty to say, no, that's not what I was doing. I was doing something much different than that. Something that would look to any homeowner to be unusual. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. Either way, you're paying your respects. You're probably getting your closure. You didn't have an opportunity to say goodbye. I was mm -hmm. his sister's friend, and I would have done anything for them. Right. He probably looked at you as a big sister. Well, there were some things that they would probably, I'm not speaking for them, like you to do for them now. And that is to let the process go forward, to trust in the evidence and not in gut feelings. Trust in the actual evidence. Weigh the logic of the evidence. And if the evidence adds up to conspiracy, fine. But clearly at this point, it does not. This is a woman that's intelligent enough that if she turns off the gut feeling and focuses on the evidence, she'll see it. And even if you're not sure, let the process go forward. If nothing else, trust in the feds because they didn't find anything. They didn't find evidence of a conspiracy. Right? I mean... Uh... Oh my God, Sean, I had an accident in my driveway during one of our many blizzards, yeah. um, like backing up the dri what? <laughs> driveway, the car spinning. I go to look to see what's going on. Car clips the porch, glass shatters. Wow. He happens, JJ shows up in my bloody driveway <laughs> mm, and he's like, are you okay? And I was just like, I don't know what's worse. 
this or having to tell my husband. Oh, a long oh, way to go from Canton to Cambridge. Yeah. I got to tell you, yeah. the traffic so, for, hey, for a thousand between bucks. Between all beautiful. that happening, JJ says, to, you know, I'm like, I got to get a rental car. And he's like, why do you got to get a rental car? I said, because my husband's taking my car since I broke mm -hmm. his car. <laughs> wow. Now I understand. Now I get it. Yeah. <laughs> and so JJ says to me, well, why don't you just take Kristen's car? Because they still like Kristen's car. Oh, wow. Nice and his father was using it to get the kids around. He's like, don't, don't worry about it. There's no reason for you to rent a car. My parents and I both think you should just take her car until your car gets fixed. Don't even worry about it. Wow. So my car gets fixed, and now it's time to go and pick it up. And this JJ, hey, Joan, why don't I give you a ride over to Cambridge? We can go get the car now. I mean, that's the kind of guy he was Jesus, to everybody. Amazing. Not just to me, to everybody. Yeah, so people amazing. like him, like people, like I said, you're lucky in life when you meet people like this. Right. You know? Yeah. So, you know, you're not happy with what happened. No. And, like, I, I love Karen. Sure. I love JJ. I love his parents. I love the kids. I love his sister. Um, she loves Karen, but she didn't know Karen back then. She loves her now. So, I mean, she had met Karen a couple of times. That's it. Um, you know, if if they ever needed anything, it's still hard not to just to be there for them. Sure. But I'm sure they're angry with me because I I can't lie. No. Well, I, I... the angry at you because you're not even attempting to weigh evidence. You're going on a gut feeling that goes against the evidence. That's why they're angry at you. I hope. I hope they're watching this because maybe they get a sense of how you're torn. You're torn. In right? some ways, I think if they're watching it, they're probably mad at me because I'm saying nice things about yeah. her. But I am. Um, she loved his dad, like loved him. Yeah, Karen, Karen, she did. Oh, yeah. she oh. Loved him. She loved those kids. She loved John. So, did you? Would you yeah. have any details into uh, details about what Karen did for the children as far as a fund or some kind of fund or? No, I just you know, know that. that. So Karen, Karen's obviously smart. I mean, her father oh. is a brilliant man. He's a sure. so when you look at him, he's just this. My mom would say, oh my God, people, you've got to realize, yeah. Karen is an accountant." We, we, as a society, we've evolved into. Yep. There's no, there's no gray area. It's black or white. Yep. And if you're on the other side, you're an enemy. I mean, look at yourself. Yep. You're torn. I mean, you're torn because you love everyone in this whole thing, and yep. you have your opinions. You know. Yep. So, um, yep. well, um, I just thought I think. Listen, I'm so happy. I mean, I'm happy you've reached out to me. I'm, like I say, I don't know how you. So yeah, like I said, I mean, I think you took, I, you did take some hits. I mean, let's face it. Oh my because, god, I'm gonna take hits. Um, yeah. I had so much support. Like people have said to me, I'm so proud of you for speaking. You know, for. It's, it's, heartbreaking. Yeah. it's heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, it's honest, the town needs to heal. These parents need to heal. The torch and support. Um, and just like the other side, they're carrying the torch and support in the memory of John. They're his family, but it's got to be draining. I mean, come on. I mean, we see on people's faces. I do think I'm wonderful. Like I said, the Boston Police. I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, final thoughts. Just final thoughts on this whole thing. Your Does wishes. Anybody, what do you, what do you wish? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Does anyone have a question for Joan? If you have a question, give me a cue. And I'll light it up here on the, uh, oh, here we go. We got, uh, where is, here we go. John. It was John's day of, okay. I've always wanted this too. It was John's day of first. What does that mean there, Olivia? I have no I've idea. always wanted this too. It was John's day of first. But yeah, like his first time going to the house, right? Yeah. Yeah. Who would have thought? Uh, what else we got here? Oh, here we go. Kate C. Oh, Jesus. These, these go quickly. What happened to the dog? No idea. Any insight on that? No idea. Here we go. Here we go. Right. Stay in the room and right. keep them company. And you might even bring a pillow with you to stay in the sure. room with them to be there. He goes. Um, Kaylee is a smart, smart girl. Right. And uh, I think she will say it. Um, I think their relationship, unfortunately, is completely destroyed. Even if she's exonerated and they completely like. Again, you know, just she's talking about the niece being a smart girl. The niece still spends a lot of time with Jen McCabe. Okay who's kind of a surrogate mother now and you're asking her to now so she's already lost both her parents and then her uncle who was raising her and and if she was close to karen and i have no idea or not then she's lost her too but now you're asking her to see the light and and to recognize i guess that that Jen McCabe, the person who is now probably one of the closest people in her life as she was then and is still kind of apparent to her, to see the light that this woman framed Karen for murder and took a, and played a part in killing her uncle? That's the light you want her to see? Do you see no cruelty in that? You, you see no cruelty in that? I mean, to make these kind of statements based on a gut feeling. I, you know, and listen, I, I don't, I guess we'll probably 
I don't know if anything else was said in the last five minutes of this, so we'll um, hop out of that for now. But I don't question the sincerity of Joan's feelings here or that she's a good person. But, you know, Sean was a lifetime in law enforcement, should have some ability to weigh evidence in these cases. Joan is not inclined to even try to weigh evidence. And Sean is not inclined to really rigorously question anything that doesn't fit the conspiracy. And, it, I, you know, you're, a tremendous amount of harm is being done to real people. And that's both, that includes the nephew and the niece. That includes all of John's family. Um, to accuse people of things that you're not sure of and that there's no evidence for and that are extremely unlikely. A person of common sense would start out on this case and say, this conspiracy theory, like any conspiracy theory, is unlikely, is more unlikely depending on the number of people that people that need to be quiet about it. So you're talking about 11 people in the house and several investigators and maybe even the DA's office and stuff like that. So, you know, I'm sorry, I got to stop. Someone's people keep messaging me during the show and then you have to hear it. So, um. It's, it's a, you know, I forgot what I was saying. These messages interrupt me. So please don't message me during the show on Facebook or on my text messages. If you know I'm live, if it's an emergency, like you realize my mic got muted or came unplugged or something like that, message me. But other than that, if you're listening to this now or you listen to this tomorrow and you know I might be live, please don't message me during the show because it's an unnecessary distraction. So please don't do it. Um. But you should have started out in this conspiracy with at least a healthy sense of skepticism. And maybe the needle moves one way or the other as time goes by based on the evidence you see, and that's okay. That's a rational point of view. But you should have at least started out with some sense of skepticism. And with that sense of skepticism, until the needle moves to 100%, you should not be accusing innocent people of being part of a murder cover-up. I mean, you take, for instance, Kerry Roberts. Now, one of the things we learned is Kerry Roberts had known John since high school. She was from maybe even earlier, but at least since, since high school. I think they went to a prom together or something. Kerry was from uh, was originally from Braintree, like John, but then lived in Canton. Kerry didn't know Jen McCabe or the Alberts. She, did, she met Jen for the first time the day of John's murder day of John's death. So why is Kerry Roberts going to lie about the things that she heard? And there were several things that she heard whose testimony in the car and, and at various points along the way there is very damning to Karen. And, you know, even Turtle Boy kind of recognized this at the very beginning, like, wow, Kerry is an unlikely conspirator. But then once he realized after a couple of days of this or a week, I forget exactly what it was. And he started looking at her testimony was damning to Karen. So then all of a sudden he started attacking Carrie as being part of the conspiracy, but it's not reasonable. It's not, I mean, because she doesn't know the Albert. She doesn't know Jen McCabe. So is it this Lex Luthor, Jen McCabe? Is she literally like Hannibal Lecter? who could make that guy Miggs in the prison cell next to him swallow his own tongue? Is she that powerful of an arch villain that in the moment that she met Carrie Roberts, she could convince her to go along with the conspiracy? I mean, these things are not rational beliefs. They're not rational beliefs. And so it, this is why I say weigh the evidence and trust in logic. Don't trust in gust instincts on true crime cases. Gut instincts are important if you're in a crowd and you face potential danger. Gut instincts are useless in trying to weigh evidence in a crime. And they're they're hopefully not something they're close to useless on a jury, although I'm sure there'll be a factor in a jury because people will be trusting their gut, the jurors will be trusting their gut instincts in trying to decide who's telling the truth. 
Um, and that's, that's acceptable, but I hope that they weigh the evidence more than anything else because physical evidence, data evidence, eyewitness testimony evidence, those things are much more important than your instincts. And, and so, I mean, this is what I really just want. I, I want my legacy to be moving people in the direction of weighing things logically. And there are a lot of really smart people out there that don't do it. Uh, it's just not their forte. And it's something you can teach your, You can teach yourself how to do a better job at that. Just you start out by, as Sherlock Holmes said, eliminate the impossible. And then you end up with the truth, even if it's improbable. But you start out by looking at that. What are the different possibilities? You have these logic trees. And then you can eliminate certain ones on the route. And if you eliminate one thing, all the odd things, that, if you eliminate one pathway, all the odd things that come after it don't matter because that pathway has been eliminated. That's just how logic works. It works in chains like that, all right? So if you can, for instance, show that it was impossible or highly improbable to plant taillight evidence, then it makes it really difficult to try to come up with a conspiracy here. And that's what has happened. That's what turned me in this case. I, you know, it had nothing to do with any, I still have never been to Canton. I'll probably never be, I'll never go to Canton. Why would I ever go to Canton? You know, I live about an hour away. I, you know, I do go to Boston, so I don't go too far, but I, I, I don't have any reason to go to Canton. So um, I wanted to mention before I get off a couple of, we'll go in a few things. Maybe we'll get to a couple of questions, but please do me a favor. Click subscribe. If you're listening now on Twitter, hop on over to YouTube and click subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. So it doesn't cost you any money. Just move your finger up and click subscribe. Um, now we do also have on April 20th for people that are interested in it. We have, we're doing an outing, a little small outing to the Lizzie Borden house. And if anybody's interested in that, just let me know. And then we're going to get together for a lunch afterwards at Scotty's pub. And we'll have a couple of drinks if you want, or have coffee if you prefer. Uh, and we'll try to avoid the Karen Reed case. So that way people can feel welcome from whatever side you want to be on. Dave McGrath is going to be there. And some of the other regulars that you see here will be there. Unfortunately, Tom Fleming will not be there because he lives in North Carolina. So he is a Worcester guy. So he's from Massachusetts. But, um, you know, so we'll just have a good time. The tour is an hour. So April 20th, it's a Saturday, 1130. And uh, got to be there at 1115. It's in Fall River, Massachusetts. And uh, and we'll just have fun. If you want to the case or get some more information, you can watch my the series that I did uh, a year and a half ago on the Lizzie Borden case. It's a seven-part series. And it, it, it shows you a lot of the interesting questions and dilemmas that come up with the trial. It'll make a tour of the house a lot more meaningful when you go through that. Uh, I'm also should mention that it, you know, we know that the motion was granted access to the phones for Kevin Albert, Brian Albert, Chief Berkowitz, and Brian Higgins. That was granted this week. So that's the big development. And I'm told that probably means probably that the trial itself will be delayed till May. Now, I don't know. Well, that, that we, nobody knows that for certain until the judge determines it. So if there's some other way that that evidence could be obtained in a timely manner, then maybe you could avoid that. But I don't know if that's possible. Do the feds have that information and they could turn it over? That could do it. Uh, or since each one of the people involved said they will comply with the judge's order, do they have that information ready or do they have to sign something? Now, if, if it has to involve the phone companies, if they have to sign something over and the subpoena has to go over, whatever, now you're talking about man, I, I'd be happy if the trial's still in May because now you're talking about a layer of bureaucracy and involving lawyers of the phone companies and stuff like that. So I don't know how long it would take. Maybe it takes months. I don't know. But I'm told that May will be the time to look forward. So hopefully that information is handy. Um, I've said, I, I'm going to, next time I'm, I'm live, I'm going to make a, a bigger picture of that rock. But that boulder, Behind the electrical box, if you missed it when I showed it earlier, was pretty important. That could 
possibly be how the head injury took place. And I don't think it's something that could be tested. Certainly not now, but now, but probably even then, because you had a foot of snow of snow that fell afterwards. So I would think that that washed away any evidence that might have been on that rock, but I'm not sure. And we don't even know. And again, that was just speculation. I'm not saying that John actually landed on that rock. It could have been in front of it, behind it, to the side of it. We don't know. Um, we have no idea what the state's theory is of how these injuries were caused. All we know is that the state does have a theory. And when, of course, we've been told by Alan Jackson that the feds hired an independent for uh, accident reconstructionists who, in their words, disputes it. But again, Jackson is very clever with his words. So we've seen this with library gaps that don't exist. There's no gap in the library video. It was motion triggered. Uh, the non-human hair, there's no non-human hair. They just wasn't enough in that small initial small sample size enough detectable human DNA. So... And you notice nobody's talking about a non-human hair anymore. And that was back in September. So these are all false stories. These are falsehoods that Alan Jackson and defense teams, not just Alan Jackson, defense teams are very good at injecting in order to deceive people. And that's another thing I want to see in this case is I want to see all of us who maybe never followed a criminal case before start to realize that this is part of the process. The defense teams are going to isolate things and be do clever wording be a little tricky about what things are. And you have to develop a sense of skepticism about how that evidence is presented to you. Now, in a trial, you'll see it presented a certain way, but then the other side gets to rebut it. Now, a lot of this stuff that we're hearing now, we won't hear in a trial because the defense does not want to put something up that's going to be very easily rebutted on the other side because then, because then, what if once the jury sees that several times, they're going to start to lose all confidence in anything that the defense lawyers are saying. So a lot of this stuff you won't see in the trial. You're not going to see anything about non-human hairs. I don't think you're going to see anything about a library gap. I don't think you're going to see anything about 227 searches. All that's because all that stuff is going to be so easily refuted by experts on the other side that it seems unlikely that they're going to go with that stuff. So, but we'll see. We'll see in the trial. You know. Um, another thing is we're considering doing an investigation, possibly even flying out there with a the team, me and Dave McGrath, Tom Fleming, and some other people, uh, a film crew. We want to look into the Evansdale, Iowa murders. If we can raise enough funding for it down the road, we're going to do this. Maybe we'll, we'll set up a special GoFundMe for this. And if we can raise a few thousand dollars, we're going to do it. My motivation is, is this is these were murders that the killer is probably still alive. They happened in 2012. It's unsolved. There is a fair amount of public information out there. I, I'm not naive enough to think that we could solve a case. No. But is it possible that it's naive, but possible that you come up with one small clue that wasn't found before, or if nothing else, create some publicity draw a little more attention back to the case because these poor kids i think they were eight and 11 years old were swiped off their bikes in broad daylight near a highway near a three-lane highway on a bike path near a lake very brazen bold attack and their bodies were found i think 20 miles away in an obscure location that they were found by hunters so there's some solid clues there you could go by because only a pretty limited number of people might have known about that location that, to hide those bodies there so um i think there's some clues that you can look into obviously there's a lot of information that the police have that, that they haven't released and that would be helpful but they're not going to release it so we don't even we don't know what the cause of death was we don't know if the girls were actually in any way molested but i don't know to me as you guys know my time isn't all that much. Hopefully it's significant, but not that much. And to me, it's all about if you can do something that will help. Uh, there's finding a case that maybe you can make a difference in and apply everything that I've learned and Dave has learned and 
Um, I'm also getting Bill Noguera helping out with us already. Um, I know that's controversial, but he he had, does have a brilliant mind and he has a lot of insights. So I don't know. Maybe this is something we can make a difference. So keep that in mind. If there's anything you guys can do to support it, I'd appreciate it. All right, I'll just go to the questions real quick. Mark Sweeney says, shitty night at Logan. Listen to Kev, such BS. Jen is a soccer mom. All right, would you feel better if I said the cross girl mom? I mean, because he's she has four daughters. They're all athletes. And when Turtle Boy was there this summer, was at a lacrosse game. Does that feel better? To me, when I say soccer mom, it means that's, I don't know if her kids actually played soccer or not, but it's a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a term that, it, that captures what she is. Okay. So. Uh, where was Higgins Jeep? You know, I've I've heard this is from Jason. Um, so we'll show this here. I've heard that Higgins Jeep was parked in front of the driveway until he left at he logged in at what uh at the police station at 2 30, I think, or was it 1 30 or 2 30? I forget. Uh no, one thirty. I'm sorry. He logged in at one, so he would have left the party around one thirty, and taken the short drive to the police station and logged in. I had heard that he, had, I'd heard that he had a plow attached to it. Don't know. I've heard that he was parked on the same side of the street as the house, and just in front of the driveway. But I don't know for sure. That's my understanding of it. So would that have, if Karen had backed up, would she have reached that? You know, those those are things that people could ask. But I don't have the answers to him. A little bit of information on it, but not much. Eldon, just to Eldon messages me a lot, and he and it's not that I don't sympathize with your case, Eldon. I just have never really been able to fully grasp what it is. So. I'm just not the person to help you with this, but I, I I don't say that unsympathetically. I know you've probably been through a lot in your life, in your personal life and whatever. I just, I reviewed that case as best I could. I had Aaron review it back in the day and it just wasn't something that we were able to make a lot of sense out of. And uh, that doesn't mean that someone else can't. So I, I, my heart goes out to you, whatever you went through, but I, I just don't, wasn't able to do it. Kirks uh, points out that the black box data showed no events. Now, this is an interesting question, right? We don't know what the black box data showed. We have just two indications, one from the prosecution back in September and the other one from a motion filed by Unity in January. So in, in, in September, the state said that the, let's say the black box, but that's, we'll get into that in a second. It's a more complicated thing than a black box, but um, that the electronic vehicle data showed that Karen went back, reaching a speed of 23 miles an hour, went a total of, I think, 62 feet, and that did not hit the brakes after striking John. Now, I'm not quoting that exactly. So did they... Uh, actually, If I, I when I went back and looked at that after in any statement, the state did use the word event. So according to the state's version of that data, there was some kind of event recorded. And then in January, Yanetti said there was no event recorded. Now we just don't know. We have not seen the black box data. These things are complicated. You have multiple sensors um, on your vehicle. And some of that data is recorded in the black box. But in addition to that, you have the entertainment system in a modern vehicle like this records all kinds of information. It can also record GPS. It can record, it can even record uh, video and audio. I'm not saying it did here. And one of the problems here was that the, the software that was needed, it's, these things are, these, it's not like your computer. These things are very sensitive. And so if it was disconnected improperly from a battery or something like that it could lose the data or to download the data might be you might get one shot at it and that's it so because the software was not available by the manufacturer 
And I don't know if it ever, that's what they were talking about this summer. I don't know if they ever did get the software enough where they could get information of it, but both sides had to send representative and agreed to how this is, I think it was like around the first week of December where they removed that data uh, from the entertainment system, which is separate from the black box system. Was there any useful data in that? We don't know. We don't know. So nobody has indicated that there was. All we know is just based on looking at um, stuff that was listed in the court documents as going in that, that that process took place finally in the first week of December. Um, Kevin, when is David back on his stream? I talk to Dave every day, but he's very, very busy. Um, he's His career is doing very, very well as a private investigator. So I think maybe it's just a matter of time to not have time to do this kind of thing. And, you know, this, it's been a real experience for all of us to see what's happened over these last uh, eight, nine, 10 months, what's going on with these channels. And they brought Dave on as a kind of a partner on these shows in June. And, but we were discussing this case since it broke out and, you know, we didn't, we could never have foreseen where this is going to go and the way it, it cause, causes friendships to form and then break up and all the nastiness and people threatening families and people threatening sending pizzas and stuff like that. And um, people trying to have your, your PayPal taken away. And it's just a lot of stuff that you would understand different people can say it's not worth the price. In fact, most people have said it's not worth the price. That's why I'm kind of alone out here. Um, no one else can really deal with this mob. It's it's not that they can't, but it's, I'm not saying they're cowards, but it's not it's not worth it to them. They have too much else going on in their life that just strictly as a cost benefit analysis thing, it's not worth taking on this free Karen Reed turtle mob, and everybody knows that. 99 T-Bone says, why do you suppose that Brian Albert and Brian Higgins both lied about talking to each other on the phone at 222? Okay, this is a good question. And we'll even put it up on the board. The short answer is I don't know. I don't know that they did lie, first of all. Um, the phone call, according to the feds, was only 22 seconds. So when someone calls it a butt dial, it no longer meet. That's what old timers like us call it because when we, in the flip phone days, that's what those kind of more simple phone days, you'd have it in your pocket and it would dial someone. And that can still happen with a smartphone, but a lot of times it's more complicated now for me, a lot of times I'm hanging up on somebody and then, but the other person has already hung up a half second before. And I hit that other number in my contacts and I call someone that I, that we, that I recently talked to. There's all different kinds, you know, kinds of ways that these, butt but these butt dials happen that don't involve your butt. But um, was that what happened? Was that a simple explanation that they gave because they didn't remember it? You know, did they not remember this 22 second call? Or was there something, were they lying as part of a cover up, right? Or was it just something embarrassing? Uh, so, based on what was just the, explained at the hearing last week, there was something embarrassing going on. Uh, Brian, you know, so let's let's not go into deeper. Let's just say that Brian was involved with a a marital relationship situation with his wife, and somehow a call was made. And let's just leave it at that. But this is things happen in the world. The world people are complicated, and sometimes we don't want other people to know about those things, and they have nothing to do with the conspiracy. How did he not see John when he left? And Karen, so I'm not sure who lady is talking about, but you could be talking about several people that walked by there or drove by there, right, that came from the house. But if you look at that picture I showed you earlier, it's not hard to see at all. And it's not hard to understand why Lucky didn't see anything either if he went down the street because there's no street light there. It's a very dark area. It's the that area that you see in every yard that's in between the property that has bushes and trees, okay? And so it's a dark area with other objects 
to draw your eye on a dark night like that with there's no stars in the sky and um there's also other things to draw your eye to and that there's a fire hydrant and there's that electrical box that i showed in that picture and there's a flagpole and john was behind that in an area where there's grass and just above just also mulch we're not sure if he was on the mulch area or on top of the grass we know he's at least partly on top of the grass um there's a boulder there that i showed you know and you're outside hurrying to your car because it was about 18 degrees so not really i don't think difficult to understand why uh julio suave says why would jen then say pull up behind me um you don't know what she's seeing from outside one of the things that i've always well that i recently have talked about was it was a recent insight of mine if you just throw it out there as something that's a possibility now when we first we under, so ryan nagel put, arrived at the same time as karen and john and according to them, Karen and John briefly stopped in front of the driveway and then pulled up to the edge of the property. So later on, Matt McCabe, who was in the doorway, kind of watching out for John, and Jen was doing things inside the house, charging her phone, probably socializing, having a drink, but occasionally coming back to look out the window. And they testified that they saw Karen and Jen at the back so near the driveway, and then pull up. So when we saw that, we're assuming that what Matt and Jen are describing is that same thing of Karen uh, arriving, stopping briefly in front of the driveway, and then pulling up. But I think it's very possible that's not at all what they were seeing. What they were seeing was around 1232. That's when Karen put the SUV in reverse and slammed the gas. And we... And according to the state, went 62 feet. That would bring her right around to the driveway. And so at the driveway, she would have stopped and then possibly come forward again, right, to go in the direction that she was going. Um, that seems likely to me what Jen and Matt actually saw when they looked out the window. So we're confused when we think what they saw what they saw was karen arriving at 12 24 12 25 and then pulling up uh, i think she would they arrived at about 12 24 and maybe pulled up at 12 25 or maybe even less than that they didn't stop long in front of the driveway when they first got there it was according to the gps it was a very short time that they stopped there so you know matt's in the doorway but he's obviously talking to guests he's in you know he's and looking out once in a while so they would have only saw it. So it's more likely to me that they saw something else. Uh, but we don't really know for sure. Hopefully we'll get a better idea from the GPS, from Karen's phone, if it was on at that time. And from if they were able to get the GPS from the car. Scott, thank you very much for the donation. Appreciate it. Did the black box in the Lexus reveal any information? It must have, uh, but we don't have the specific report. And like I just talked about, we had some, some, conf some seemingly conflicting testimony. Goat Boy says the state hid the black box data. I have no indication of that. Um, this is what you see when, again, looking at the Delphi case thing, you know, you have a, a large bureaucracy of investigators and labs doing this work. And anytime something gets delayed because of the bureaucracy, later on, the defense says, see, they were they were trying to deny us. You know, they violated our Brady rights by by denying us this material. And it's not that case at all. It's just because you have a, a large bureaucracy of people, investigators, lawyers, secretaries and labs working on this stuff to pull to pull together a very large body of 
information at the same time they're doing other cases. Um, not so now we know goat boy is a very, very strong free Karen Reed person. So, but that's okay. Let's keep it civilized goat boy. And, uh, and then you're welcome here because we can have a back and forth and it can be useful. I've actually recently shown something that you posted, um, on the channel. I forget if it was a video or a picture that you put up, but I gave proper, proper credit. You had posted it on, on Twitter. So let's be nice to each other, okay? Uh, he says, the defense expert showed up to test it, and it was removed. Um, not sure if you're talking about the black box or the entertainment center, but yeah, you, uh, the way it usually works with these things is there has to be a representative from both sides there to get this out. So, oh, Carrie, you don't have to do that, but thank you very much. I appreciate it. Free Eldon. <laughs> Again, I, I don't, I, I, I'd say it sympathetically with Eldon. I just wasn't able to make sense of it. And uh, it wasn't enough for me to cover there. I, I, it's possible he had a little bit of an injustice, but he was admittedly a drug dealer for 10 years, by his own words, not mine. And he got, was, at the, the warehouse where there was a drug raid and unfortunately for him he was the only one they caught and what they charged they didn't really catch him in anything dealing with drugs they charged him with he closed the door on one of the agents that was coming in and so they charged him with i think salt on the on, assault on the on the officer and from what i remember kevin reddington was his lawyer and had a deal for him to um to basically plead guilty and do no jail time. But he indicated to the judge that he didn't believe he was guilty of because he was not aware of closing the door on the cop's foot. And so the judge said, well, we're going to go to trial then. And I had this myself before with a stupid traffic thing, you know, my only court experience. And uh, I was charged with driving uninsured, but in fact, my car had been insured. But I didn't know what I had been charged with until I got to court that day, and so the and I waited there all day. And by the end of the day, I was willing to plead. It was going to be, you know, no contest, fifty dollar fine, and you don't do anything in six months, and it's it's off your record. And I was willing to plead that just to go home. And the judge asked me, he said, "But you're telling me you actually aren't your car was insured?" I said, "Yes, it was insured." And he's like, "And yeah, you can prove that?" I said, "Yes." And he said, "Well." But why do you want to plead then? I said, because I don't want to have to come back here and sit here all day. I just, so for $50 to make it go away, I can live with that, you know? And he said, well, he was kind of, he kind of reminded me of the judge on my cousin Vinny. He was, um, he was like, well, I want you to know that I understand what you're saying, but we take justice and we take truth seriously around here. And I'm not going to have somebody plead guilty to something that they know they didn't do. So I'm going to set another date and you're going to have to come here and show me and you come here and show us uh, proof and i which i did do and it, and i again had to waste another half a day there so it was i would have rather paid the 50 dollars. but that's how the judge took at it and i think the judge in eldon's case did the same thing but unfortunately it didn't work out so well for eldon because he was found guilty in the trial and was sentenced very harshly to um i forget what it was but like nine months in a federal prison like a very difficult federal federal prison so it kind of sucked and but he felt that there was corruption involved in reddington because reddington was unhappy that he, he didn't go through with the plea deal and that's all i know of the case but there was a lot of paperwork involved and a whole bunch of other stuff that i couldn't make sense of so hopefully i've given what i did know of the case justice there eldon um but again kerry thank you for the donation goat boy's gonna puke don't puke dude it's not worth it. Uh, 
Um, so this is I know this is far. So I'm gonna Kirks is wrong on this as far as I know. He said that the states removed its claim about Karen deleting the ring footage. They now claim it's unavailable. That's always what they said. Um, they implied that she deleted it. They never said she deleted it because, I mean, at least not in the charging document. In the charging document, it says, it says it was it's missing, and that it pointed out that Karen had access to the family computer. And that's it. So it's implying that she deleted it, but it didn't say that she did. So hopefully, we'll find out in trial what happened to that footage now. But again, this is where people get the weighing of evidence can get irrational. So I was following a conversation on Twitter today where somebody, I think it was Karen from True Crime and Wine, put up there, can anybody explain to me, and please don't, and they said, she said, please only, only answer this if you have an answer. Explain why it would make sense for Trooper Proctor to delete footage of Karen coming home that night. And of course, somebody replied with something else about, uh, Proctor emailing the company for Ring and finding out how long the footage remained there and blah, blah, blah. And oh, but that might be an interesting thing to point out, but it doesn't answer the question. Because the bottom line is it would make no sense for Michael Proctor or anybody on the state side to go into that phone and delete footage from Karen getting home. How would that further the conspiracy? Just assume for the moment that Michael Proctor is in on some conspiracy to frame Karen. How would his deleting video of her coming home in any way help them? I don't really get it. So, because for instance, Karen pulled in to the garage front way, so you wouldn't see the taillight at all. Uh, especially she'd be coming in from the other direction. So you wouldn't even see it as it came around. You wouldn't see anything from that taillight. Because it's the, it's the right taillight. It's the passenger side taillight. So that would not show up on that ring video. So even if you're, I don't know, I just, no one's ever been, we've asked this question since this summer and nobody on that side ever, ever even attempts to answer it, ever. So they'll put out some distracting argument like that, but they don't answer the question. It doesn't make sense. The only, per, if now to me, there are two possible explanations to the missing ring footage. One is somehow because of weather conditions or lighting or something else, for whatever reason, the ring didn't get triggered and didn't pick up Karen coming home. Um, that doesn't seem likely to me. You had a spotlight there. You have a sensor on it. You have the vehicle coming in right under the ring, right into the garage. And actually, there was they have two ring videos there too. We've never seen any video from it, but there's also a ring system on the front door. So there should have been two triggerings of Karen coming home, two videos of that. So I can't for the life of me imagine how both of those systems, neither one picks up Karen coming home. So why would Karen delete it? Well, the theory would be is if she went out again or did something that she didn't want seen, like stopped in the driveway to look at her taillight, maybe. Um, I don't know. I cannot think. So at least you can, at least you can conceive of why potentially Karen might delete that video. If she went out again to look for John, she wouldn't want anybody to know that. And there are powerful indications that the GPS was turned off. Uh, but we don't know. I've never seen any, you know, would the niece have heard Karen coming in and out a couple of times? You know, we don't know. Um, but you can, but I cannot imagine, and nobody has ever posed, proposed any reason why Trooper Proctor or the conspirators would want the video of Karen coming home deleted. And so I'll try to catch up and chat, but nobody, you know, nobody has proposed it. So Kevin, didn't Higgins lie about clocking in if he was calling Brian at 22 from home? Uh, I did catch that too, Jason, how they mentioned that. And I, without having the documents to go by, I believe that it was just a matter of Yanetti 
misdescribing it because we're pretty sure that Higgins had clocked in. So when that call came, but Higgins, my understanding is had a, in his office at the Canton police had a cot and a shower. And so it was not unusual for him to go into the office. We wondered earlier on in this investigation why that kind of thing might happen. I'm told this. Now, again, I can't verify it. I, I have, you know, I can't say So I can't say it with certainty. So that's a possible explanation that, that when Unity is saying home, he's really not meaning home, that Higgins was at his actual apartment or house or wherever he lives. But I don't know for sure. Comfort and joy says, personally, I'm not going to believe anything in pretrial from either side. Everything will come out in trial. That's why the defense are so desperate to not go to trial. I mean, this is going to trial, kids. This, I mean, it's there's no question this is going to trial. There was nothing even close to show you, to show us that that um, that the grand jury was presented with enough false evidence or any false evidence that would even potentially change its decision. So, oh, hey, Dave, good to see you, man. Did, glad to see you checking in. Uh, this I'm just catching. So that was a half hour ago. No, 20 minutes ago. So that's how far behind I am in chat. Fiona says those videos in evidence are going to be interesting. All the videos. So we know there's Cassie's Corn Convenience, there's the library, there's the Pequisite Farm, whatever that thing is, and there's the, the Jewish Temple. Um, the real thing that would be there be interesting we need to have a kind of a side shot of karen's taillight with her breaking that's i to me i think that's what will really tell this the condition of that light at that time and there is evidence that's going to come out at trial it's in discovery now i'm aware of it but i am not aware of it because i have ever been given any access to discovery evidence i'm aware of it because it was only put into discovery recently. And so I'm aware of what was in it before it was turned into, turned over. And I don't want to get too specific. I'll leave that up to other people on this. But there is audio in Karen's voice that's going to show that the taillight was in pieces that morning. In her own words, with Yanetti sitting there. So it's going to come out in trial. I hope I didn't say too much with that. If the people that gave me that information are upset, I do feel bad about that. I don't want them to be upset. I don't want them to feel like I've... So I left it vague enough. Um, but that's something that's... It's going to be said in trial. I've known about it for a while and kept it, but I think it's important to say it. And it's going to come out. Bob says, Dave is a brilliant kid. I love the guy. I give him my best, Kevin. So hes I think he's here now. So you just gave it to him yourself. I'm sure he probably saw the comment. FBI experts will be testifying. Yeah, I don't think there's any way to avoid it because even if the defense doesn't want to call him, that's the interesting thing here. You know, we don't really know. Like obviously Alan Jackson brought up the 227 search and the that was supposedly by an FBI expert. And also the the independent expert that was supposedly brought in. You know, to me, the fact that the feds didn't find any evidence of a cover-up, despite a desperate need on their part to find it in order to prove, in order to justify Josh Levy's heavy-handed participation in this and unusual participation in this, the fact that they didn't find any evidence of a cover-up and that none of these people are targets of the investigation, no charges came, nothing seems to be coming, and it isn't going to be coming because if, after all this, they're not targets. It's, it's, it's time to give up the ghost on that. So to me, there's almost like you could almost make the case that the whole federal thing has backfired because now the federal stuff, and we don't, until we see what is actually in that 3,100 pages, we don't know. But it seems to me that that federal stuff, um, 
it tends to implicate Karen. The fact that it certainly it, it can't be used. It isn't going to be useful to establish. It, it tends to disprove the idea of a conspiracy from something related inside the house. Heels in the air. Thank you. She says you're not alone. And I always forget to go to her channel. I, I thank you for reminding me. Um, appreciate it. Uh, and want all the support we can get out there. You know, it feels like I'm alone sometimes. When I say that, I don't mean that there are obviously many people that don't have YouTube channels that feel the same way that I do. But because there's not that many of us that are out there with our, that take the brunt of it from the, from the zombie horde. But thank you for, I got to check out your channel more. Thank you for covering this. If, if you're covering it in an objective way. Lady says, but he said he was sleeping at the time. So either way he lied. Well, maybe, maybe not. Right. Was he doing something? But that doesn't mean that there's a conspiracy. So you're talking about Higgins. So, you know, we got to go and see what he actually said. But keep in mind, Higgins turned in his turned in the information on his phone right away. Higgins, no, he is not flipped. He's not a target. He hasn't been indicted. If Higgins had flipped and was cooperating on some conspiracy, he would have been indicted. He would be indicted. Okay? It would mean, and he would be suspended, and he's not been suspended. So when when you flip, you still get charged. You just get a generous conditions, like Eldon. Not that he flipped, but Eldon, Eldon um, had he worked out the plea deal, he would have had no jail time. And this is how it works in the mafia. You, you know, you're, you're uh, Sammy the Bull, excuse me, Sammy the Bull. You come clean. You say you're involved with 19 murders. And he did do some jail time for that, but he gets a very generous deal, but he still gets charged. So anyways, I, you know, to me, did Higgins misremember that meaningless call that came that was only 22 seconds long? Maybe. They, like I said, they've been drinking all day. Or was it something more embarrassing? Those seem like the more likely explanations. Uh, I don't think Higgins is married or wasn't at the time. Yeah, there's no question the federal ex experts will be testifying, but in whose favor? And, you know, that'll be tricky. Uh, Dave says five cent Lucy. I still do, but not going to fight. So he's saying he still thinks Karen's innocent. I don't tell Dave what to think and he's welcome to push back, encouraged to push back at me every, every day we talk on any particular theory. I, I don't expect anybody to give in to my theory. What? Cause I'm taller or I'm older. Kirk's, you know, dude, you got to be reasonable. I'm not, that's not what I said. You're putting stupid things into, into, into my mouth that I said that they're all magical putt dial. I mean, you could not have listened to a word I said then because of course not. I didn't say that. I said, we don't know, but people lie or hide evidence about embarrassing things all the time in these cases. Do you have embarrassing things on your phone or have you ever had embarrassing things on your phone that you might not want someone to know about? So just because you, in theory, in theory, lied about a 22 second call that apparently was the only call they had that night. 
that doesn't mean you're part of a vast cover-up conspiracy. Again, need I point out, the U.S. attorney gave all of their lawyers, including uh, Brian Alberts, permission to say in court that they were not targets of the investigation. So, you know, clearly whatever they found, it's an explanation for the butt dials or the potential lying or whatever that has nothing to do with the conspiracy. Or they would be targets. And like, or, 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 if, or, or if it was still under like some kind of investigation, they would, they don't have, the U.S. attorney doesn't have to take, meet with that lawyer and he doesn't have to say that. In fact, he could just meet with him and say, well, we don't comment on something that's under investigation. But they gave them permission to say in court that they're not targets. That's powerful. That's very powerful stuff. Julio, when did Higgins leave and go home? We don't know. Uh, you're saying, all right, so she's uh, saying that that Higgins testified that he was in bed at home when the phone was on the nightstand at 2.22. Just to point out, we do not have that testimony, okay? That's federal testimony, or potentially, if he, if he may have said that in the grand, state grand jury too. But nine of, neither of that is made public. So all we have is some version of it that's put out by Unetti. I'd be cautious about that. Here's a good question. Wicked psyched. How did he launch sideways and not backwards if he was backed into? It's the angle. If you, let's see if I can do it my coffee cup. If you're coming in like this and you clip something on the side, it's going to send you back like that. So we don't know the exact angle that she was coming in when she hit him. That's something that'll have to be determined, hopefully, by the black box data. But um, there was, I witnessed a, it came upon a motorcycle accident this week, uh, just a couple minutes after it happened. I didn't see the accident. I first, as I was leaving the gym, I saw a motorcycle police officer racing to the scene. I didn't, and as, and as I got down the street, the Motorcycle cop off had just arrived, so it was long before it was what well, was minutes before the ambulance or fire truck arrived. So I got there pretty soon. I didn't know what I was going into. I saw an SUV facing the same direction as me pulled over. Clearly, had been in some kind of an or stopped there. Clearly, had been in some kind of an accident. And the trooper was a little bit oddly going over and talking to the driver. And I say oddly because I didn't first I didn't see another vehicle. Then I then my eye caught two. This was when the high school was getting out and there were two high school gr uh, girls on the track team that were tending to someone that was lying in one of those spaces we were just talking about. That's a divider between two homes, two properties. And in this was some was bushes, which this time of year, are no leaves. So they're pretty thin now. And this I saw somebody lying there with a helmet on. And he was he was up a little bit like his head was up a little bit, lying kind of on something. And his arms are moving, so he was, you know, he was conscious. And the two girls were helping him out. And um, and then moments later, as we, you know, the traffic was almost blocked, it's a single lane there. I had to kind of creep around the SUV that was parked there, um, that it, that was involved in the accident. And as I was going around it, I saw in front of it a totaled motorcycle. And so I was able to figure out what had happened. So the motorcycle was going down. It's not a high speed road, so. But if the guy was speeding or the kid was speeding, maybe he was going 30 miles an hour, lost control, skidded into the SUV, which probably wouldn't have been stopped, but maybe it was going, maybe it was able to stop before. I don't know. But it skidded into that. And that the force of that accident launched that driver. So he landed about 20 feet away at an angle. At an angle. Uh, but that's that. But that made sense because the motorcycle skidded from the opposite lane. So it was coming at an angle when it hit the SUV. And then just then it's just geometry after that. So you kind of, if you guys play pool, you know how that kind of works.
uh caitlin is actually brian's daughter right i don't i don't know why that's important hillbilly nitro has his own website if you got everything about guns i don't own a gun i don't know much about guns but hillbilly nitro has a good website that deals with all that so if you want to check out if you're into that yeah butt dialing he said is a term used for accidentally calling someone exactly Nagel would have seen what? We don't know what Nagel would have seen. We don't know what Nagel was doing. He's in the car. Guy that age, who knows what he's doing? Playing with the radio, smoking a joint. We don't know what he would see. Oh, are you saying he would have seen the accident? No, absolutely not. Because we know from uh, we we know that 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 they are both of them arrived about twelve twenty four, and John's according to John's phone, he stopped moving at twelve thirty two. So the accident happened around twelve thirty one, twelve thirty two. And um, by that time, Nagel was gone. So no, Nagel would not have seen the accident. Uh, yeah, so uh, the grifter says, so they witnessed Karen Reed hit John, but they don't know they witnessed it. You do. No, I'm trying to make sense of what they saw. I don't know with anything with certainty. And no, they did not what they would have noticed was in fact they wouldn't even have seen karen going in reverse so what i'm saying is matt mccabe is in the door karen's off talking to i mean not karen jen is off talking to people okay matt's talking to people too he's and he's occasionally glancing out the door karen backs up through john nobody's looking nobody sees it nagel's gone there's nobody outside all right nobody's looking out the window she backs up at high speed and comes to a stop somewhere around the driveway. It's maybe she stops for, she may have stopped there for a minute or two to gather her bearings, maybe even five minutes, who knows, right? But in shock from what may have just happened, she stops there. That's the point where I think Matt looked out the window and he saw Karen's SUV parked there. Have, now they had they didn't see her back up. They had no idea what had just happened. And at some point, Jen looked out and saw the same thing, and that's her memory of it. And then they saw her pull forward. Why did she pull forward? Because again, this is just my theory. This is not based. This is a possible explanation for what they saw. She pulled forward because she knew what had just happened. She pulled up to look to see if John was hurt, and she left him there. That's to me is the way to make sense of this. But the GPS should hopefully show this kind of back and forth thing. Uh, but we don't know, right? We don't know until we see it. Aaron's channel is true crime and cooking, true crime, true, I have, it's something to do with true crime and cooking. Oh, no, Dave says it's dubs the blood on. Wasn't there something about true crime and cooking too? I don't know. I'm not sure. That's a good concept too, by the way. True crime, uh, true crime and cooking. Those seem to, these cooking combined with a subject matter seems to be um, really in vogue. Even on TV shows like mainstream programming, let alone YouTube. Julie says, go home, grifter. You're drunk. I wish I was drunk. I don't drink that much. I have about a drink every two months, maybe every three months. The only time I get drunk is um, once a year, I usually meet Tom Fleming at the Cape. That's my little two-day vacation. And also, I usually meet my sister at the Cape, too. And that, that usually involves a couple of drinking nights in there too. Though my sister tries to protect us and make sure me and her husband and her kids don't drink too much. Dave says that his channel will be back in some form. He will. He's got the bug in him once he has a little more free time. 
He'll be back. Uh, Mark says 62 feet puts her in front of the neighborhood neighbor. I think the neighbor's yard is what he meant. Um, depends on where she started from though, right? Like if she pulled forward a certain distance and, and I, I think, I think it puts her exactly at the driveway. <laughs> all right so just so, just to show you all right so kirk's I, I you know this shit is so irrelevant so he wants people to go back to a couple of weeks ago when someone was talking about caitlin and i didn't recognize the name because she's irrelevant to the case and you know little so, oh yeah that's that's brian's daughter so i don't know what that proves to you that i don't know anything because I didn't recognize the name Caitlin, who is just irrelevant to this case. It didn't, the only thing that, you know, she's just not relevant. She does, she's not, didn't witness anything, anything important that we use. So, but you're going to keep dwelling on this as though this proves to you that I don't know what I'm talking about, right? Because I don't know, would, would it, would it also be the same if I didn't remember the name of the dog, which is Chloe, but I mean, who cares? Jesus, grow up. Yeah, usually when I talk to Dave now, he's it's from his car. He's either on his way somewhere or doing a stakeout or something. And I don't think any of his stakeouts have been in Can I mean have been in Canton. <laughs> Sean does those. Or he runs them. He's, Sean's in Florida, so obviously he's not doing them himself. Jamin says, Kevin, why do you purposely spell Proctor's name wrong? Like I do it purposely. I, I don't, I, aren't you a writer? What is, it's a name. What does it have to do with writing? I mean, it's, see, it get, it's good to even bring it up because it shows that people do this without really thinking about it. And you shouldn't do it on a police report, which it seems that uh, Michael Proctor did do in a few in a few instances. But it doesn't indicate anything. It it definitely it definitely doesn't indicate. Well, you think I'm trying to hide Proctor's name from what? I mean, it's just the fact that you the things that you guys focus on, it's unbelievable. AM says the box could really help based on top of the black box. Yeah. I mean, hopefully there's some really good data on that. Something that I'll. The grifter says, can you please reference where I can find where it says that Jen was back and forth getting drinks and whatnot when Karen pulled up to 34 Fairview? It's conjecture. That's common sense from testimony. We know that Jen was in the kitchen charging her phone. Okay. There's no reason to think it wouldn't be normal if she was just standing by the window for 20 minutes. Okay. So it's a little thing you might want to consider, Grifter, called common sense. It could come in useful someday for you. I'm not putting him in timeout as long as he's not insulting other people. Or I mean, it's at some point I don't really care. It's just he's, it's good for entertainment. Yeah, it's not in the docs that she was doing that. It's common sense. They did. They, who goes to a party and stands there with their with their nose in the window? You go to a party where your friends and relatives are. You think you're just going to stand there looking out the window the whole time? No, you're going to be in there getting a drink and talking to people. We do know from the testimony that she was charging her phone in the kitchen. Uh, so 
it's just common sense. Tom says the Glara is, uh, when was the last time you did a show that included YCT's content? You're adult. I mean, he's not a serious guy. He's a grifter. And I'm wondering any day, but he's, it's perfectly fine for entertainment purposes. Despite what a lot of people think, I don't think he's probably an idiot. People say that kind of thing. I don't think so. I think he's laughing his way to the bank. Uh, uh, and he's from Tennessee. He's found this is a good way to make money. Lock in. When this one is milk dry, once to, I mean, at this point, it's almost milk dry. And I'm kind of wondering when he's going to jump ship because now that the feds have found nothing, there's really not something here for most rational people to cling to anymore. But as long as there seems to be a crowd that still believes in it, I guess you can milk another couple of months out of it. But then he'll find some other case somewhere else in the country, maybe the Delphi murders or something, and just kind of go and grift there. And it's, it's a good way to grift. But the problem is, is it requires you to have absolutely no concern for the truth and no concern about smearing innocent people. That's... Kevin, can you clearly see Karen Reed turn the wheel and bump John's vehicle in the 5 a.m. video? Uh, yeah, I can see it. I can see that move. Uh, oh, are you saying that she do it on purpose? I mean, I have no evidence of that. You know, we've always... Uh, other friends that I've talked to in law enforcement from day one thought that she was doing that on purpose because she knew the tail I was broken. But, you know, we just don't have any evidence of that. So we can't really assume it. We can entertain it as a possible thing. But, um, Eldon says to forgive the glare because his shirt is so tight that he can't breathe right now. <laughs> Mine's not tight. I don't have a physique you want to show off. So this is, I usually wear double X. It just, that's what fits me. I wear double X. <laughs> Elden was uh, seeing Kerry's donation. He says he wants 20%. <laughs> uh, Will Kirk's asked you to please avoid from the caps. That that stuff is like kind of a rule for me. So avoid the caps, please. I don't even cap one part of it, okay. But not, if you do it in all caps, that's like yelling. I'm not a fan of it. Um. So he's saying that they claim Karen deleted the footage. Again, I don't know, you know, where you're basing that off of. Was that, I only can go by the charging document and it's not in the charging document. I don't know going back, where did they, did they say that in court? Did they say it to the news? I don't really know where that comes from. And I doubt you were following it back then either. I mean, really, was anybody here right now in chat following this case before Turtle Boy brought it to the public attention last April? I don't think Eldon's being a dick. I mean, he just, he, this is something that he feels it was an injustice and he wants to get it out there. And I'm not even saying that that isn't the case. I just never could really fully make sense of it in a way that I could present it. So. Goat Boy says the state won't reveal the evidence on the ring in full. I mean, it seems super unlikely to me. I don't know where these things come from. You know, at some point, you like I said, you got to focus on the fundamental evidence here, and it's very rock solid. And so you can start, if it wasn't rock solid, then a lot of these explanations might be worthwhile pursuing. You know, because you have to try to figure out what happened. Like I said, in the Lizzie Borden case, you have a true mystery there because it seems like Lizzie is the only one that had the opportunity 
to kill both the parents, to kill her stepmother and a mother. And the killings were an hour and a half apart and in a small house that the only people there were her and the maid, Bridget. And Bridget was outside for the first killing and upstairs in her third floor bedroom taking a nap for the second one. So it, just at that starting point, you could see why they assumed it had to be Lizzie. But they never found the murder weapon. So when you get a true mystery there like that, then you have to start looking at some of the more odd things to see if it could be more meaningful. But in most cases, or many cases, I'd say most cases that there are indictments like this, it's, you know, the evidence is going to be fairly solid once you eventually get it all and put it all together. We don't even have all, we just have what was made you know, what was made out there, what was, what's been made public so far. Uh, Kirk says we see Karen's taillight on when her stoplights come on and she pulled out. Okay, again, I'm not going to pull this video up again because I pulled it up so many times and Kirk's has seen it and I posted it on Twitter. When you look at Karen's vehicle from behind, you will not see the broken pieces. You have to see it from that side angle. The majority of the people, you can maybe see it from the, from the behind a little bit. That's But where it shows up clearly is from the side because the, the majority of the broken piece is around the corner. And I had identified that when we first had a team look at that video this summer. And before we saw any pictures of where the taillight was broken, we said that's where it has to be. If it, Not conclusively, but if it's broken, that's where it is. Unfortunately, if I when I show you the video, and I'm not going to do it now. I'm tired. And But if I show you that video, you'll see that when she's coming from the side view, she never hits the brakes. So we don't actually see it. And hopefully... We will at some point. Hopefully, one. That's why I say in those other videos. Hopefully, there's a side angle that shows her hitting the brakes. Uh, but I can tell you that in her own, you're going to find out in trial. You don't have to believe me. That's okay. Even though everything I've told, almost everything I've told you, with the exception of the no true bill, everything I've told you has come through. I told you about the DNA testing months ahead of time. I'm sorry, the canine testing. I, I, I mean, I've everything I've given you has come true. I'm telling you. And again, this is not from any kind of a leak. That in her own words, she's going to describe in an audio that you'll hear in court how the taillight was in pieces in the driveway that morning, long before it could have been tampered with. In fact, she even pulled the piece out and left it in the driveway. The reason she was telling that story was because she, at the time, her focus was trying to, she was trying to say how the state of, um, that the state police lied, but they didn't find any pieces because she said, well, they had to have, because I dropped a piece there. So you'll hear it at trial. Uh, T-Bone asked about the indications that the GPS was turned off. Okay both the defense and the prosecution because the, the the prosecution describes her going in that direction back towards 34 fairview but if they had the gps they could just say where she went and then the defense confirms that by saying the state lied about her going back to 34 fairview which they didn't say that they just implied that she probably did um and they, the defense said they lied because there was no evidence to show that. Well, had her GPS on, had her GPS been on at that time, the defense could have said the GPS shows where she went and she didn't go back to 34 Fairview. They didn't say that. They didn't say that. So that's a powerful indication. Glare, I've answered your question. If you just keep repeating the same stupidity as though I haven't answered it, then I will block you because then it gets annoying. So I, hopefully that, again, I'm 
about 20 minutes behind on chat trying to get caught through. So maybe you've heard the answer and I've stopped. I don't mind you coming in and contributing. I don't mind you pushing back. But if I answer the question, and especially since your question was stupid, let it go. I just had to put the glare in timeout. I mean, the guy doesn't really add anything to the debate. He's not interested in the truth. I don't really watch his show, to be honest. But I mean, I first when I first heard of him, somebody messaged. Well, actually, I didn't even know that he had a channel. But earlier in the day, he had posted on Twitter, and I just remembered the name Glare. He said something like, you know, boy, isn't it, it, it? It's amazing how it seems like the only people in this case that follow this case that have read the documents are the free care and read people. And I said, it seems to me it's the opposite. It seems to me that uh, that that nobody on that side has read the documents. Of course, now we know that many people have. So obviously Olivia, but Olivia was not really prominent at that time. And But most of the people that I talked to that have read the documents ended up being and in fact, the turtle never would give anybody the documents. He wanted to monopolize. That's all you would get was Turtle Boy um, taking a piece of the documenting and highlighting it and putting it on his website. I asked him several times for the documents this summer, and he didn't want to do it. So um, there it is. So when it comes to documents, so then later that night, somebody messaged me, I don't know, 7.30 saying, hey, this is this guy, the glare, he's doing a reaction video to your video. So I got on there before he started going over my video and thinking maybe he was a semi-serious person. I said, hey, you, you don't have to go over my video if you want. I'm here. You can have me on your show and I'll gladly answer any questions you want. But that wasn't his game. And of course he lied. He said, yo, he said, you'll get your chance. Anybody that I do a reaction video will get invited on my show. He never invited me on his show. Not that I would go there, but I mean... It, it just never, it never, it never happened. Um, but you could see what his game was very quickly. He had a very large live, much larger than he's normally used to. There were several hundred people there and they were all turtle people. And Aiden himself was there and they were there for my blood. What drew them there was to come after me and he could, he's a grifter. So he can sense the way the wind is blowing. And, and he, knowing that, he went out starting the video without any of he wasn't going to be objective about what I was saying. No, of course. That was he was going to try to feed them meat. And you know, he's going to throw meat to the crowd, is what he was going to do. And uh I watched it for about 15 minutes, but it was stupid. There was again, it may not be that he is stupid. It may be that he's forced to argue things that are stupid because he's grifting. Uh, you know, for instance, he's sitting there saying that um, back then that any idiot can tell that these are that that this arm wound is the result of a dog attack. Now, all I was saying in my video at the time, and this was before that we learned that the canine testing had come back negative. But what I was saying was, is we don't know. I mean, this if you look closely, we have the medical, we have the ER staff, and we have the medical staff saying this was not the result of a dog attack. And if you zoom in closely, you can see that the wounds are actually very shallow, which doesn't quite fit what a dog attack would look like. Now, I'm not trying to fault anybody who leaned towards that being a dog attack. Anybody who thinks it now, it doesn't make sense because we now know the canine test was negative on the clo on John's clothing. So it's so it's done. It's you don't hear it's even the judge made that clear. Do you have any issues with this to you know? And he said, no. So there's no longer going to be any claim of there being a dog attack. But back at that time, it was at least 
something you could dispute, but I, you know, but to sit there and say, this is definitively a dog attack, you know, and just reject what the medical experts say. And even if you take a close look, you didn't really see if you've, well, what I did back in, in May was uh, even when I, at the time, thought 227 was a data and it was a certain thing, right? I didn't know that it was in dispute. So I was like, well, if 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 she was Googling at 227, how long to die, Nicole, then there's definitely a conspiracy, right? That's what I thought back then. But I still, you approach each piece of evidence objectively. And when I saw the dog attack stuff, I went and I spent probably weeks kept periodically doing this Googling images of dog attacks. I never found any that looked like that. I couldn't find a single one that looked anything like that. Now, that didn't mean it wasn't a dog attack because you were looking at autopsy photos, which usually when you Google this, you're going to get the, the person is still alive. So the flesh maybe looks a little different. But I didn't see. Yes, I understand that those lines give people the impression of claws or something like that or, or nails, you know, but I couldn't find a single other picture that looked like that. And I challenged people many times on Twitter and on this channel. And no one ever sent me one that looked like it either. In fact, one person did send me one once. And for a moment, I was like, wow, that looks exactly like it. But it was John's autopsy photo flipped upside down. So, they, so even other people that believed in the theory were forced to do stuff like that. Nobody could find a picture that looked like that. There's, um, and I've also, it was also sent photos of what a German shepherd attack would look like. And the wounds would be way deeper than that, be wreckage. And the dog locks on with the jaw and it, and when it locks on with the jaw it does not have the claws on the arm and if you think about it that's how it would be right when a dog attacks it locks on your arm and you shake it but it's not putting its claws on your arm okay so it wouldn't look like that so i understand why people not really thinking it through too deeply would look at this and say that's what it looks like but if you think it through deeply and research it it doesn't look at all like what a dog attack would look like. So, but that's all I was saying back then. And, but he just wanted to appeal to the mob. Let's face it. That's it. So, all right, we'll jump to the end. It's, I've been on a long time. So um, jump to the end and see if there's a last question. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you for being mostly polite and interesting. And we're certainly willing to take on both sides just as long as they're good questions. Even if it's a bad question, if I ask it once and I give you the answer, you should should be able to accept it. Especially if it's a question that's based on something that's misinterpreting something that I might have said. All right. Comfort and Joy says... Oh, all right. Melanie Little, Little, Melanie Little literally interviewed a dog expert. I remember that. And it was, you know, Melanie Little has never once that I've seen, and I don't, this is why I don't want, I could see right away, just grifting. I, I, I'm not saying that she's not intelligent, or that, you know, wasn't a lawyer one time or something like that. She never, a reasonable person doesn't start out on this case saying everything 100% on one side and never questioning anything especially in a crazy conspiracy theory. And that's what she does. So that's grifting. To me, if you start out taking a really unlikely conspiracy and all you do is just cover everything from the side of that and never ask any kind of a question, never apply any skepticism about the defense theory, that's grifting. That's grifting. Uh, I don't have a Venmo account, Elden. So I don't know what you mean. I never set up a Venmo account. So he says, Kevin is an expert on many things, including choosing guests. Tune in next week and have your Venmos ready. I I, I mean, I guess if you're try applying, I'm trying to make money. I don't use, I don't have a Venmo account. I do have a PayPal if you want to give me some money. <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? Says this oh man, the 2W. I've seen him or her before. It's always been a problem. Um, 
Did you listen to what the dog trainer said? I don't fucking give a shit what a dog trainer said. It's a dog trainer. It's a dog trainer. All right? What does a dog trainer know about a dog attack by a German shepherd? You want to compare a dog trainer to a medical examiner? I really don't care. Okay? This is why you have to apply, again, trust in logic. All right? And understand how the system works. Just like as a defense team, we'll always find a medical expert or a data expert to say their case. They know how to find these cases. They find these people. Okay? I've been on juries. That's how it works. It's the same thing with grifting channels. So if there are, you know, it's not hard to go out and find someone that wants to insert themselves into the case like they're an expert. And you're going to base all your, listen, you don't have to trust me. Go to Google right now and Google dog bite attacks. Do it. I tried, I did it all through the month of May. You won't find a single picture that looks like that, John's arm. You won't find a single one. So. So you're going to believe some dog trainer. Okay. A five cent lucky. All right. So turtle must have just gone off the air or something. So all the nuts are starting to come out. The zombies are starting to groan. She said, oh, my God, you are grifting. I'm the only one, as if I'm the only, I think I'm brilliant and successful. I make claims to be neither. Okay. I do claim to be able to apply logic, logical analysis, and I'm sure you cannot. I'm sure many people here, most of us here do. But the free care and people, read people do not. And that's just the truth at this point. At this point. Now, as far as grifting, if I was grifting, I would have done like the grifter, the glarer, and played up the conspiracy. All right. Because when I first started covering this case back in April, right after the first week Turtle Boy did this, thought there was probably a conspiracy and I knew conspiracies sell. So it, it, so that point, yeah, it was like, you know, it wasn't grifting because I believed it was true. But that's the difference is I was never focused. I would never sacrifice truth in order to get views in order to get subscribers and donations. Unfortunately, almost all of the other channels, that's what they do. It's all about donations and views and subscribers with no interest at all in the truth and no concern about what innocent people you smear. That's the difference. If you're a grifter, you don't care about the truth. I made the sacrifice. When I stood up to Aiden, I lost 800 subscribers, which was, I don't know, like 20% of my channel in like an hour. All right. So let's see Mike Crawford do that. You know, he, Mike Crawford, one day, because of some calls, he got decided he was going to try to take a new tone. And I, I applauded. But it didn't last because Turtle from jail put out the orders. There'll be no wavering, he said. No wavering. What does that mean? You can't even ask questions. No more asking questions like Mike Crawford. And Mike Crawford never asked a damn question again after that because he's a coward. All right? And people that are out there doing this on YouTube and don't ask questions and are afraid of that mob and afraid of Turtle Boy, it is what it is, brother. I stand up for the truth. And if the truth, if the facts change, I'll change with it. And if on some certain other issue, Turtle Boy is right, I'll back him. I'm not automatically against Turtle Boy. I don't approve of many things that he's done, and I don't think he cares about the truth at all. But if he happens to be right on something, on some other issue, I'll back him. I have nothing personal against him. All right, guys, my back is killing me. Thank you for being here. Been on a long time and uh, need to go get a snack and go to bed. But this was a long show. Thank you, Tom Fleming, for the sticking with us, sticking with it, uh, stick, staying off this late. I know this is late for you and keeping the peace. But, guys, everybody have a good night and enjoy the rest.